Yeah, LTL true crime, we going deep in the dark Yeah, yeah, peeling back the layers, expose the hidden mark oh, yeah. From the streets to the alleys where the secrets lie Getting into minds of the wicked, no alibi LTL true crime, don't ever live the web of evil No stone left unturned, we diving to the pond Yeah, we digging up the dirt, bringing justice to the crime LTL true crime, unveiling dark realities every time Yeah, LTL true crime, we going deep in the dark yeah. Peeling back the layers, exposed to him more oh, yeah. From the streets to the alleys where the secrets lie Getting things in mind, something wicked, no alibi Hey, I pick the true crime. Who go with dark realities every time? Yeah, I've been real true crime I'm going with dark realities every time Yeah, LTL true crime We going deep in the dark Yeah, peeling back the layers Exposed the hidden heart oh, yeah. From the streets to the alleys Where the secrets lie Getting into minds of the wicked No alibis LTL true crime We going deep in the dark Yeah, peeling back the layers What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the LTL True Crime. We're live here on February 18th, uh, 2024. It's a Sunday evening, Sunday fun day, and I want to welcome everybody back into the live show. I have amazing, uh, really fun guests here I'm going to bring on tonight, and we're going to talk about uh, this guy that we've been following here on the channel, uh, Nicholas Rossi, a.k.a. Arthur Knight, Nicholas Aliverdi, and all the aliases that he has. And uh, I thought that I needed to bring someone on and set the record straight tonight. Uh, someone that has known Nicholas uh, or known of Nicholas Rossi for, I think, the last 24 years, what Brian said. Um, and let's just get it straight from Brian's mouth. We'll bring him here in a second, but I want to give you a little bit of a bio. So Brian Coogan, uh, likes to be called Coogan. So we'll call him Coogan tonight, uh, is a American, uh, businessman and former politician and a member and was a member of the Ryan house of representatives, uh, who represent, represented district 83 followed by district 64 from 2000 until 2005. Uh, in the Rhode Island House, he served as Committee of Corporations, and Coogan also served on the East Providence Council uh, from 2008 to 2010. And the reason, of course, I want to have him on tonight is he's known of and knows Nicholas Rossi going under the alias of uh, Arthur Knight. I won't wait too much longer here. Let's bring in Brian, and uh, we'll get him up on the panel. And I want to welcome in Brian on the panel. Coogan, how are you? I'm well. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you for doing this. And uh, I really appreciate you being here. And uh, we've been following this incredible, fascinating uh, story that is this Nicholas Rossi Aliverdian, a.k.a. Arthur Knight. And I, I was telling you earlier the way that I came across uh, you was, uh, you know, through the Providence Journal and seeing an interview that you had when you actually called uh, Nicholas over in Scotland and was like, hey, Nicholas, how are you? And he was just acting like he didn't even know who you are. So can you tell us, you know, a little bit more about you and then we can get into to Nicholas? Sure. Um, so I've known Nick since two, the year 2000. Um, and uh, he was, uh, he was a, a page up the, um, uh, it was a page up the state house. 
I believe he was 14 years old. Um, he was very aggressive as a page. And for the for your audience doesn't know what page is. Yeah. A, a page is a bunch of kids, you know, usually, you know, someone who worked on someone's campaign, and then they would get them out, they would get them in the state house when they're elected, and they give it like $15 a session. So whether it's the an hour, two hours, three hours, it was just um it was I believe it was for the amount of time session. So in Rhode Island, different from I think in Massachusetts, Rhode Island we're part-time legislators. Okay. We're six, we're six months out of the year, and we, you know, every most most people, you know, work, get out of work at four uh, or three o'clock to get up to the state house. Four o'clock session would start. So you would have the pages up there, and they would be on the outskirts of the 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 uh, the dome of the state house um, on the house floor. Sure. And as as you needed a bill changed or the wording changed, they would take the page or pages downstairs to the lawyer's office, they would strike certain pieces uh, of legislation, put other pieces in, bring it back up. The rep or senator on the, on the other side of the rotunda is the senators. And we would um, use the kids to go back and forth because they're young, right? They're fast. Yeah. They, you know, they go on the lawyers, they change, they bring it back up now. Now you start talking about the bill if they want to strike something. Uh, so it's pretty much, and they would go out to your car if you had to get something out of your car. You give them the keys to your car. Like run and go like to run. Like yeah, yeah, so every yeah. boy and, and girls, and they were great. Uh, they were all great. Yeah. Wow. So that is that. So how did you actually come to be to know Nicholas? How did you get to familiar with him? I know uh, he had some. Uh, there were some reports that he was having issues with DCYF. He was in DCYF. Is that how you became to know him and get him into into politics? Were you the person that actually introduced him into politics? or No. No. The okay. funny thing is, and I'm glad you brought that up, and someone really needs to investigate that because – so my niece was a page up there before I was elected. She worked on uh, my brother's friend's campaign, mm -hmm. and she wanted to be a page, so he brought her in. Here's a kid from the street. In and out of DCYF, in and out of forced homes at such a young age. Yeah. Um, we really, I till this day don't understand how Nicholas Alberti and Rossi became a page of the state house. Yeah. A lot of rumors, certain people brought him in, and that that's that's probably a whole nother story. But so myself and other reps uh on the house side, Nick was a page. Um Great kid, smart, uh, super, super intelligent. Um, had to be the first one. So if you said, hey, um, you, you call for a, a page to come over, Nick would actually cut the kids off, almost give them an elbow check, you know? Wow. Bounce them out of the way. Rep, what do you need, rep? What do you need? Very polite, used all his manners. How could I help you? What do you need? Um, and he just was so aggressive and such a great kid. We all took a liking to him. Wow. So how how did you first get introduced? Was it up at the state house, or did you you meet him outside the state house and and kind of start to build? Tell us how you started to build, you know, this friendship with him. And I I read in an article that you at one point were thinking about actually adopt adopting him. Right. Um. So how it was working up the state house uh, with Nick and all the reps, we all took a liking to him. He would come up there. He would be the first one there and the last one to leave. And when I tell the last one to leave. We're shutting the lights off the state house. He's leaving. And wow. sometimes he would just disappear. We didn't even know where he went. Then we we, we all, uh, he told us all different stories. He was in group homes, foster homes. Uh, and we felt bad for him. And he was actually looking for someone to adopt him, uh, to bring him into their home. And, you know, that he was having a hard time with DCYF. Hmm. They're not giving him the, the kind of services he needs. And we were like, oh, wow, we're overwhelmed. Here we are. We're legislators, right? We're trying to pass laws for DCYF. Here's a kid in the system, um, and he was in and out of group homes, and he, was, he said he was being abused. So what had happened was he was coming up with deep scratches on his face, black and blue under his ribs, um, uh, you name it. He said he was being assaulted. I'm like, what are you talking about, Nick? And he's like, I'm in and out of group homes. The state shuffled me all around, and I can't find a permanent home. And at the time, I had no kids, zero. Now I have five. <laughs> so yeah, you were telling me one of your youngest just got his uh, his permit. So that's yeah. My son, my my youngest son, Blaze, just got his yeah. permit. And um, 
and they were all good kids. Yeah, uh, yeah. My, my other son above blaze, he just became a police officer in the military. Oh, wow. Um, so we're very aggressive, very active, but at the time we had no kids and Nick yeah. was like crying on our shoulders one, for one of the reps to adopt them. So I said to my wife at the time we had no children, I said, listen, there's this kid up the state house named Nick. Um, he's been being abused, sexually assaulted, mm. um, been kicked. Uh, he claims his ribs were broke, fractured his arm. Um, you know, you want to adopt this kid? What, what do you think? You want to give it a shot? And she was like, ah, I don't know. You know, we just bought a new home. We just yeah. got newly married. You know, we're going to start trying to have our own kids. Right. Never, never thought I was going to have five. Never <laughs> my life. <laughs> They got it and adopt Nick. So what had happened was Nick kept calling me uh, and pressuring me and other reps. I didn't know then what I know now. Right. Nick, Nick likes to pick his victims. Yeah. He knew I had a soft spot for kids. He knew that, um, you know, he saw me falling for the bait, you know. He right. put the big meat on the hook and yeah, he's, yeah. he's reeling in. And finally, um, I said, Nick, I, gee, I don't know. I'm, I'm awful young, you know. Just got elected, uh, new house, new marriage, everything going on, running my own business. And then finally, he he caved in. Uh, I caved in because he called me from the courthouse. And he's screaming into the phone and crying. Back then, there were pay phones, right? Yeah, right. And that's what we um, used to do uh, for the young kids out there. We had to pick up and drop a dime. The, the yeah. same, drop a dime. <laughs> drop a dime. Um so he dropped several dimes to several reps okay. and tried to get a rep to come down there and talk to the judge, wow. the one of the judges, um, and uh, the chief judge is what it is. So yeah. I'm sorry. Come here. Yeah. No problem. Take your time. <laughs> he, 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 he's got to yeah, say hi. He, he, won't, he won't leave me alone. Say hi. Say hi, Calvin. <laughs> All right. You said hi. Good job. All right. <laughs> he keeps bringing his ball over for me to throw it. But um, so. Um, his name's Calvin, by the way. All right. We got a new, we got a new friend on the channel, Calvin. Yeah. Um, so, so he called me up. He said, rap, you got to come down here. They're trying to get rid of me. He's screaming into the phone. I was like, what? So he goes, I need you to adopt me two days. Now, Nick is very aggressive. I mean, one of the most aggressive people, uh, high pressure sales person you'll ever meet in your life. He mm -hmm. wants it. And he wants it now. And he knows how to push every button. So I, I said to him, I called my wife. I said, listen, I got to go down to the courthouse. That supposed to be trying to ship Nick out somewhere away. And um, she goes, I said, do you want to adopt this kid or not? We got to make a decision, you know? She goes, I'm going to leave it up to you. I said, all right. So I ran down to the courthouse, parked my car. Um, and as I'm walking up to the stairs of the courthouse, all of a sudden I get this. I didn't even see the kid coming. Yeah. I felt like I felt like a linebacker. Boom! I got hit. Someone's hugging me and crying. And look, it's Nick. You know. Yeah. So at the time, he's about fifteen years old. Wow. Um, fifteen. Short, wow. Short kid. You know. Yeah. He's like, rap, please. You're gonna adopt me. The judge, the DCYF. They're trying to kill me. They're trying to get rid of me. I know too much. I'm exposing them all. I'm like, Nick, slow down. Slow down. I'll go up see the judge with you. Uh, I can't guarantee I'm going to adopt you because I was still in the back of my mind. You know, I was like, ah. Right, right. You know, it was a big commitment. And let, me ask, let, me ask you, let me stop you real quick, Brian. I just want to go back. So l let me ask you. So I got two questions for you. Now what you know now about him, you said that he had, he started showing up with injuries, the scratches on his face, the arm. The, do you think, one, let me, let me ask you before you answer, do you think that was things that he was doing to manipulate? And then I also want to ask you, you said in the back of your mind there was just something about about this kid that was kind of throwing you off a little bit. Yeah, maybe give us some reasons why you know to that as well. So, and uh, I'll answer the first question in sure. a second in yeah, the yeah. story with the judge. And, and uh, so, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a regular guy. I'm a I'm more of a street guy. You know, uh, right. I come from a broken home. Um, so that's why I have a big heart. I love to help people because I've been in some situations when I was a young child yeah. and my sibling and my siblings as well. Um, <clears throat> matter of fact, I lost my brother at a very young age to a tragedy. Um, so 
I'm sorry for I, your loss, by the way. I lost my brother, and we talked. We talked about that. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. sorry about that. Thank you, thank you. And um, so having such a tough life and struggling to, you know, just to eat, you know, no different from most guys that I grew up with. Yeah. So I, it's not poor me, but so I always took my negatives and turned them into positive. But when it comes to kids, I have this soft spot. Mm -hmm. Um, so Nick had me wrapped around his finger. He didn't know it, but at the same time. Being a street guy, you know, it was like I was. It was like a tug of war in my head. You know, my heart was yeah. like, "This kid's playing you." My mind's like, "Hey, you know, you were in that position at one time with your own family problems." And you know, uh, I said, uh, "So I was going back and forth with that." Um, so we went upstairs. So in other words, he was trying. I felt the con coming on. Yeah, I really did. Um, the fake tears, the crocodile tears, um, for me. I mean, it was just, it was so overwhelming. The broken ribs, he said he had the fractured arm, you know, mm -hmm. all, I mean, he was, he, he claimed he was beat up like evil Knievel. So it was kind of like, ah, uh, you know, he had a light scratch. Nothing was on his back. Nothing was on his back of his arms. Everything was in the front. Ah. I, mean, I didn't really know at the time though. You know what I mean? Ah. Is this kid bullshitting me or right. is, he real, is he really being abused in there? Right. Well, I don't know. So I said, all right, Nick, let's go up to see the judge. And I'm going to get to that first question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Why I didn't adopt him um, um, and what had happened. So I go upstairs. I go in there with the chief judge. And he said, Rep, how you doing? Because I know I know him, right? I said, good. Uh, I said, and then he, and Nick's on the side of me. And then he looks at Nick. He goes. Nick, what are you doing? What's going on here? You know? Yeah. And he was very polite to me, uh, good guy. Um, and he said, Nick, why don't you go out in the uh in the um in the reception area? So Nick did. So he leaned forward and says, What are you doing? Rep, what are you doing? I said, This poor kid judge, he's been abused or sexually assaulted, all this other stuff. Yeah. And he couldn't get into details, but he had a vanilla file like unbelievable and he and i was kind of intimidated by the judge he's the, he's the chief judge he's the boss you know yep. but i didn't let him know that i was intimidated and he's like everything this kid is telling you that's being done to him he's really doing all this wow so now, they already had known they already know right now yeah. the judge didn't tell me particulars and you know he didn't get into the details and then it started jogging in my mind. Oh my God, this kid said he was suffocated with a pillow. Did he really suffocate a kid? Right, right. You know, unconscious that he said he was broken ribs. Did he break somebody's ribs? You know, because we had no way to know if he had broken ribs or not. You know, he, we only know what he told us. Judge said, this kid's a bad seed. Nope. So then out in the hallway, we hear, I hear Nick and so did the judge. We hear him arguing with somebody from dcyf and um he says to the lady if you if, if you try to get rid of me it's funny a guy one of the guys in the state house calling me um he says if you if you try to get rid of me i'm going to tell him that you abused me uh -huh. i heard the judge heard it and the judge pounded his hand nick get your ass in here so this was the the creation and the morphing into Nick Alaverdi and Nick Rossi that we know now. Right. Um, so at a young age, he was threatening people. Um, then I find out um, he was stealing, you know, in and out of foster homes and group homes. If your audience doesn't know what a group home and a foster home is, a group home is uh, usually with multiple boys. If you're a m male and if you're a girl, you go in a group home with multiple girls. A foster home is people who force you to have a place to go to. What Nick was doing at such a young age, he was opening people's checkbooks to the back, stealing the last check in the back so they never Jeez. knew. Bro. By the time they caught on, yeah. this kid was gone. Yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> at a young age. But what I want your audience to understand is the picture: a young kid who loves politics, who's got a half a brain at the time. Yeah. Being up the state house, watching debates and argument arguments of men and women Learning. debating 
and trying to get laws passed, yeah. changing laws. What you people need to understand is this kid is so dangerous. He's like a lawyer by trade. This kid would sit before session, sometimes during session, but not that often, but after session, he would read the whole law. Wow. This at a young was, age, too. And it, this is a, he's a young kid at this point, right? Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, just soaking it all in. Yeah. So I was on labor. At one time, I was on corporation. I was on the uh, uh, um, the board of directors at Ripta, which is for city buses in Rhode Island. Nick would go to meetings. He would go to hearings and listen to all sorts of legislation going on. A lot to do with DCYF. He would listen going on. So he would he would run around the state house and we're like, hey, Nick, everybody loved Nick. Yeah. yeah. Smart kid, yeah. Uh, really into it. Some kids are there. They're bored. They're looking around. They're looking around. What time can I go home? You know, <laughs> not Nick. There yeah. was a point. There was a point where the Capitol Police had to tell Nick, Nick, you have to leave. It's wow. nine o'clock, 10 o'clock at night because some days these hammers are going late. Right. Then we find out Nick's sleeping in the state house. Wow. And the state house is over 100 years old. There's all sorts of nooks and crannies yeah. that you can hide. There's places where the heat and pipes go through. Uh, certain parts of the building where it's nice and warm. So if I was on corporation or labor, we're there so late, we would order sandwiches. Nick had no problem ordering himself dinner. So he would eat. Kid was a shop kid. I'm sorry if I went on too much. I, I no, just I, it's, I, it's great. No, this is what we want to hear. It's it's almost like you know he knew to and it's almost like he knew uh, this was a good area to to uh, put in his manipulation. And the thing you got to think about, Coogan, and you don't mind me calling you Coogan. You said you like. I love Coogan. it. Call okay. me Coogan. Okay. So the 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 thing that you got to think about how dangerous this guy would have been if he made it in deeper into the political sphere, you know, all of the, the corruption that he could have got caused, you know, knowing what he's doing now is, is unbelievable. So let me, let me just take us up to, uh, when, uh, Rossi go goes into this whole, I have cancer. So he announces that from what I'm reading in, in January of 2020, in 2020, is he he puts out I guess on a social media post that he is uh, he's got cancer. Then in 2015, uh, 2020, uh, February of 2020, there's an announcement that he had died. So let me ask you: before this can cancer uh, announcement, and and the reason for this, and I'll give the audience some context here, is that uh, Rossi's death was disputed as occurred by the FBI initiated a fraud investigation against him while Rhode Island police issued warrant for him for failure to register as a SO sex offender. Uh, and then, and then he, like I said, he put in this, I think this plan now I'm going to fake cancer. And then in, in February, he stages a death. Were you connected to him still when he was going through this process of, of announcing this cancer and then this death. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, that? <clears throat> I will, but um, I'm going to back up a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Right? Yeah, of course. So what happened was in the judge's chambers, people need to hit, see that gap of time. Yeah. So Nick, um, I'm going to put this on silent. Um, yeah, no problem. So Nick, we're in the judge's chambers and the judge calls him in, pounds on his desk, calls him in. He, he and the, the, I, I believe it was a social worker at the time from DCYF who had his case, a case worker. Um, and Nick, he's arguing and debating with the chief judge. <laughs> I wanted to crawl under the carpet. <laughs> this kid at 15 and a half years old, he's going hardcore with the judge one-on-one. -on -one. And I'll be honest, he started kicking the judge's ass. Because the judge was like, whoa. And then the judge, they were going back and forth. But Nick, at one minute, he was acting like a 12-year-old child. Yeah. And then he was acting like a federal prosecutor. Unbelievable. When, when I saw that, I was like, holy shit. This kid might be a, a federal prosecutor one day. But your audience needs to understand that this kid could turn it off and on like a switch. He's a con artist. He was a con artist at such a young age. He could cry like a little boy. He could debate with you and argue with you like he's six foot four, three hundred pounds.
he would come at you like a monster and be aggressive with you or he'd go back and forth and he knew what to bring it to how high and how low so the judge goes nick i'm done your ass is out of here yeah. i was right there the two sheriffs grabbed him he's screaming and crying i felt so bad and then as he's screaming and crying he's telling the judge he's going to sue him he's going to file a, file a motion in superior court district court federal court i was like oh like this kid he was on fire yeah yeah and then he was a little boy whimpering and then he said to the judge and the judge granted and this is a true story the judge said he said to the judge he says you're gonna have the sheriffs beat me and and do this and do that and they're gonna throw me down the stairs and the judge no one not nick he says, "Cause Re can Representative Coogan come with us? C come with me, and because we they were gonna take him to a, 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 a like a group home, yeah. a temporary group home." And uh, so the judge said, "Rep, do you want to go with them?" I said, "Judge, I'd love to go with him. Keep him calm. I mean, his shirt's all wet, his hair's all sweaty. The kid was a hot mess. He was like a monster, you know." Um, so we took him down. We I went with the sheriffs. We went down to the back of the judge's chambers, all the way down to the stairwells and into this where the cells are so providence police came and there was a van the paddy wagon yeah so there was a divider in, in the paddy wagon guys on one side and guys on the other you know there was no one in there but so they said hey if you're gonna i guess that's policy they had to put me in handcuffs so they put me in handcuffs they put the bracelets on me wow. they got him to have the handcuffs on him they put us in the van so we go about a mile and a half um away from the courthouse to a group home it was a steel door um so they let me out they let nick out they take the handcuffs off me and i go with nick and, and the Bronx police we walk them over to the to the back door of the group home yeah and they take they take the handcuffs off them two guys grab nick physically grab him um so i'm standing there and they nick the door shuts behind nick i said Oh shit. Now what? Now my car's at the courthouse, mind you. I gotta walk to, to the courthouse. <laughs> so no problem. Yeah, yeah. Um I said to the I said to them, I said, Hey, what's going on? There's like, well, we can't give you a ride back. You know, I said, All right, so I walked. Didn't hear from Nick for a couple of years. All of a sudden, uh this Nick Nick, yeah. Nick Allegrian comes back to Rhode Island with the vengeance. He's on fire. He filed, um, he calls me up, rep, rep, I'm back in town, rep, how you doing, rep? And always used this man is, telling me how much he loved me, always looked at me as a father. Uh, and I kept in touch with him, we kept in touch. He was all over the newspapers, all over the talk shows, mayor, buddy, Cianti, everybody knows a famous man, but he's yeah. on his talk show as a regular. He's suing the state around and the governor, Gina Raimondo. He's suing her. Where she at now? She was a governor here, now she's in Washington under Biden, yeah. right? Yeah. powerful powerful he sues her at the speaker of the house he put everybody's name in files in federal court he filed such a good motion they said how much you want to go away yeah they paid him two hundred thousand dollars he got paid two hundred thousand dollars i don't is, do you know i didn't know the exact number did you find that out dollars yeah yeah but okay. i want to i want to give some context to the audience now meanwhile when he left rhode island this is when he went out to Utah, and this is where he got accused of all the sexual assault crimes out in, in Utah, and then made his way back to Rhode Island, correct? No, what happened was, so when he went, I apologize, when he went into the okay. group home, yep. right, they shipped him to Florida. Okay. Rhode Island had it with him. He was in every group home. He was in out of the training school or wherever he, wherever they just were done. So they shipped his ass to Florida. He ages out of the system. He comes back, starts suing the state of Rhode Island. <laughs> and then he filed such a good motion in federal court. This kid, he's he's dangerous. He's yeah, dangerous. He got, he got love to sue people. Is that what, I, I don't? And I I I heard all different numbers, but you know better than me. I never really yeah, found yeah, out yeah. the exact number, but yeah, it was a large check. And he was like a big pimp. He had rented cars. He became a lobbyist. He's going to fundraisers. He's going to the all the all the all the high politicians. He's going to the Capitol Grill. Um, he's going all the fancy restaurants and he's blowing money like a rock star, donating money to campaigns. So then he starts his legislation uh, against DCYF. And I don't want to mention their names, but a couple of reps fell for it. Yeah, yeah. 
I, when I saw a monster, so I didn't know about the sexual assaults and that at this time. Right, 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 right. But I knew he was a monster, and I always kept my distance from him. But he had a couple of reps. He wrote the legislation, and it passed. <laughs> he reformed DCYF. Unreal. He was making the Providence Journal, all the local papers. That He was working all the circuits, the local news, TV, uh, talk shows. Um, but at the same time, he's assaulted women. Yep. We didn't know it. Allegedly raping women. We yep. didn't know it. There was about eight girls from Pawtucket, Rhode Island wow. that he assaulted supposedly. Um, and there was a certain, uh, rep supposedly who protected him. And someone needs to inter do a little digging on that. Sure. Go, you know, file some app requests from the police station and assaults and, and with Nicholas Alaverdian or Nicholas Rossi. We'll, we'll talk offline about that sometime. I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. that that's some nasty shit that went on. Yeah. So, um, so here we are. Now he's a superstar in all the papers. Right. Then what happened, uh, Brian, was he allegedly assaulted. Or set, we didn't even know he was in Utah or Dayton, Ohio, all these other right, places. Right. You know, now we find out late. I, I found this all out later from his wife, Catherine, who we married um, <clears throat> and tied up in all sorts of crazy shit. So we, I, we, we didn't know any of this stuff was going on. But um, he sued. He got a lot of money. He, was, he just was a big shot. He reformed DCYF. Now, what do you want? I, I don't know where you want to go from here. Yeah. By the way, my audience loves you there in the comments. They absolutely love and, and and thank you for for giving some love back to Coogan tonight. I knew this was going to be a great interview. And I like again, I do appreciate you being here and doing this for us. Um, so anyway, so now what I come to understand around 2020, 2020, uh, Nick is now under under the invest and uh, under an FBI investigation for fraud. And uh, also, he's failure to register for a sex offender, and uh, the Rhode Island police are looking for him for an outstanding warrant. Now, this takes us to January 2020. He announces, I guess, in probably a social media <clears throat> or in the group of circle of people that he's in with that he's got cancer. And then a month later, he essentially fakes his own death, allegedly fakes his own death. Well, I think he does. And then it essentially escapes off to Scotland or, you know, where, where they found him in 2021. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And did you lose, did you lose touch with him up until then? Or were you still in contact with him? I never lost touch with Nick. Wow. Nick would always call me. Sometimes he called me in a drunk or stupor and, or on pills or whatever. My five kids, we took him a couple of times to lunch. And, but again, yeah. always kept him at an arm's length. Yeah. Um, he said he was at Harvard. He asked me for if I could uh, send some money to my credit card or something like that. I said, nah, Nick. I said, so I went to uh, CBS and I got a money card. I put yeah. up a couple hundred bucks, you know, within a year or something like that. He was never, he wasn't at Harvard. I found out he sucked at me. He got me, you know, he got me a couple of times for money, yeah. but no big deal. As well as other reps. There's, there's some reps that you'll find. I don't want to mention their names that, um, you know, one night he called me and said, uh, uh, we were talking. He was kind of like, sometimes, I don't know if he was bullshit on some stuff or telling the truth, but most of the stuff was true. I said, Nick, I got one question for you. When when I was up the state house, you always carried a bunch of keys, but you didn't have a car. Yeah. You didn't have a home. Well, what he said was, so if I gave him my keys to go to my car, you know, don't forget we're there for four or five hours. Right. He would go out to the cars, certain reps would have, you know, not, it wasn't every day, but every now and then, every chance that kid got to make a key, he wow. made a key. So now he has keys to people's homes, knows their addresses from their registration. This is what he told me. Wow. Told me himself. So I said, Nick, are you kidding me? I said, you were breaking into reps house, a, a state representative house. He goes, well, uh, a couple of times I just opened the door to see if they were home or not. And then I shut the door. I said, Nick, if you need a key and you went to their home and you knew they were up the state house. Yeah. That's breaking I, and entering. Yeah. <laughs> I, we, if you just opened the door. So yeah. all these crazy things. He was calling me for years. And, you know, some of this calm conversations, others like he was out of control and um, told me some wild shit about credit card fraud. And yeah. uh, especially if he was under the pills. Or like truth serum, you know, he yeah, would yeah. tell me big with credit card fraud. So 
fast forward so what happened was you're supposed to register as a sex offender on Ann Street of Wickedon Street in, in east side of Bronx, which we call Fox Point. Yeah, yeah. I know that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's you know, the problem is police are calling around like any of his contacts, anybody he knew, they were looking through social media. So I yeah. get a call from Bronx Police. They said, Hey, Nicholas Alaverdi, you know him, Nicholas Rossi. I said, Yeah. He goes, Have you seen him? I said, Not. Nah. And he disappeared. And I don't yeah. know if he was in Dayton, Ohio, or Utah at the time, but he just gone. Yeah. Yeah. I was calling him. So you no. Know, Next thing you know, state police, I believe it was Detective O'Connell called me. Um, Connor O'Donnell, uh, I forget. Um, he's the one that's been hot on the uh, hot on the truck to get him. He called me. U.S. Marshals come to my house. I'm with my two youngest sons. We're driving down Route 44 in East Bronx. I see FBI Utah. Matter of fact, I still have it on this phone. I, I, wow. I saved the number. So FBI um, from Utah reached out to you? Reached out to me. Wow. And he said, hey, uh, we're looking for Nicholas. Is this Mr. Coogan? I said, yeah, yeah. yeah. Goes, this is special agent so-and-so. I said, yeah. Right. I said, wow. What's up? He goes, we're looking for Nicholas Alaverdia. Wow. I said, okay, so is everybody else. I said, <laughs> and I said to him, and my two kids right there, I said, well, you're the FBI, and you're calling me? <laughs> That's what I said. I had pulled over in Hertz parking lot to talk to this the, uh, special yeah, agent yeah, so-and-so, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, you're the FBI, and you're calling me? He goes, yeah. I said, listen, I'll forward, forward you all his emails that I know of him. I will forward um, all his phone numbers, oh, no, everything, right. yeah, yeah, anything, everything I have. I said, but I'm. I said, but you're the. I said again, you're the FBI. You can't catch this kid. And he goes, listen, this kid is so good. He's the best I've ever seen. We think we have an IP address here, but it's pinging up in Maine. Wow. You know, we're, we're like, all right, it's not in Maine. It's hitting Florida. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And I don't understand any of that stuff, but it reminded yeah. me of the movie right away, Catch Me If You Can. Yeah, that's what someone just said in the chat. Catch me if you can. Yeah, I can't yeah. see what they're chatting. It's yeah, among yeah. my folks too far no away. But, yeah. Um, so they said we can't get him. He's like the best we ever known. Okay. So Nick had called me. Let me back up maybe a couple of years before yeah, then. Yeah. Absolutely. For, for your ends. So his wife Catherine calls me when they were going through the divorce. We did you saw it on Dateline, one Dateline. He's screaming, she recorded yeah, everything. Yeah. He abused it. This really, this really is about the victims. And I've been offered movie deals, sign my rights, sign everything over. I don't I don't really know you. Yeah. You asked me to come on. I tell my story to anybody because I want the truth to come out. And I'm not looking for a movie deal. I don't want none of this. Yeah. And you'll I'll never take a dime. Dateline wanted to send a car, give me food. I wouldn't even take a bottle of water from Dateline. Wow. So you're let me back guy. up a couple of You're a good guy, Brian. I said you're a good well, guy. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's really about the victims. It really, yeah. truly is. So a couple of years back, let me back up before we get to that part yeah, where you wanted to know. So Catherine, uh, after Nick, she got her uh, restraint order or whatever against him in uh, Dayton, Ohio, or Utah, wherever they were at. I'm sorry. I don't remember. It was, uh, yeah, it was, uh, I think it was Provo, Utah from what I read. Might have been Provo, oh. U well, somewhere in Utah. We know that. So she calls me because a year before that, or maybe eight months before that, my wife and I went to dinner. Nick had has had this scam going on. We had uh, he was trying to. We have water fires in Providence, Rhode Island. Yep. It's pretty famous. Nick had these people believing that he was a big part of it. So he has this big office in Dayton, Ohio. This is what she's telling me. She's telling me this is what she's saying. And Nick used to call me from his office, all luxury and everything, like a like a suite, you know. Yeah, yeah. And um. So she said, uh, Brian, it's Catherine. I met you and your wife. We went to dinner, this, that, the other thing. And I said, and that's the first time I ever let Nick pay for anything. He used the credit card. She told me it was her credit card. The bill had to have been $800. Yeah, yeah. We went to Flemings yeah, yeah, and yeah. Providence. Steak. Yeah, that's big time there. Yeah. Big time. Bottles yeah, yeah. of wine. Yeah, yeah. I don't even drink wine. I was drinking it that night. But um, <laughs> shrimp. I mean, all sorts of food. Well, Nick whips up. He gets the bill. I got. I said, Nick, I'm gonna get it. He goes, No, no, I'll, I'll get. It. I said, No, Nick, Nick. Uh, he has it. Puts the credit. Hands it to the. Hands it to the waiter. Comes back. He signs. Well, she told me she's like, Listen, I paid for that, Brian. He was using my credit card. He was abusing me. He was stealing from me. He. I, I financed everything for him. Uh, thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. And I was like, Really? She goes, Google his name, Nicholas Salaverdi and Nicholas Rossi. Yeah, yeah. Do this combination. And I'm horrible with that. But I'll tell you what, Brian, 
I carry a couple phones um, for my businesses. I'm not yeah. good with the technology. So I start Googling it. Yeah, yeah. He's getting sued by some guy, some a, a, a book, a child book, uh, several people. All I find all the stuff online. I find his registered sex offender pictures. Wow. I start screenshotting it like crazy. So fast so forward. This is, blowing, this is blowing your mind now. This is like, what the hell? And, it, you know, the funny thing, Brian, is, is, is people like this, these these narcissist psychopaths, what they do is they'll plop, you know, and, and you're a smart guy. They plop themselves down in an area. They tell their story. They get familiar. They get people to like them. And then when things fall to shit. They move and they'll move to another state and then they bring their, their shit and their tails there and they start doing it to the same people. So I'm sure that as much as he was doing it in Rhode Island, mm -hmm. everywhere else he was doing it, obviously, and he was doing it to a lot of women because he was assaulting a lot of women, probably taking advantage of them. And it's yeah. there's a lot of victims out there because yeah. of this guy. So what he would do every once in a while, he would totally disappear from Rhode Island, not take my call. I wouldn't hear from him. And it, I didn't know then what I know now. He's waiting for the dust to settle. Right, right. He's got court cases go. He's getting sued in Mass. He's getting sued in Rhode Island. He's getting sued in Dayton, Ohio. He's getting sued in Utah. Now he he disappeared back and forth a couple times to Scotland, Ireland. You know, so I never told him that Catherine. What she told me that how um, he tied her up for the bed for two days. He poked him proud of. Now this is what she said. Wow. Okay, and I gotta believe her. Um, he locked her in the bathroom for a day and a half, two days. He had her family believing that she was crazy until she recorded it. Mm. And that's how it all blew up and they got a restraining order. He had to get out of Dayton, Ohio. He never paid rent over there. He had a big suite. He had people working for him, never paid them. He had some scam going on. She told me, come to find out it's true, uh, $5,000 uh, if uh, you're a student graduating high school and you, uh, you have a chance to win five thousand dollars, you would send thousands of kids applications for forty dollars. She told me this, and um, people send in the forty bucks, hundreds and hundreds of people. Nick was cashing the checks, and he never had any intention to giving the two thousand five, whatever the amount was. And this is all going to come out in the courts. It's so this part's definitely true. So he was scamming little kids and their parents. Mom, I got a chance to get a $5,000 or whatever. Whatever he called it. I don't know what he called it. Um, hundreds and hundreds of checks were coming in at $40 a piece. Wow. You know? So um, so now he calls me. He's been calling me. And I said, Nick, where are you? Where are you? Now, he doesn't know that the state police and the FBI helped me try to catch right, him. Right, right. So he wouldn't take my call. So I took his registered sex offender picture and I put it on my Facebook. That kid called me so fast. He was monitoring me like everybody else. Yeah. And he goes, oh, my, my mother, my sister, my siblings, my father, everybody's seen that picture in my family. I said, Nick, you told me your mother and father were dead. You were an orphan. That You, you told me that in 2000. Yeah. I believed you up to this point. He goes, no, yeah. my I never said that. I said, Nick, you were in and out of group homes and foster homes because your parents were killed in a car crash, you told me. And it was never true. I didn't, I, I, up until they showed his parents recently in the last couple of years on the TV, Yeah, I, I believed up until then they were dead. So he says, he says, oh, rep, I'm dying. No, then, then uh, we had this big argument. I said, listen, you got local cops, state police, U.S. marshals, you got the FBI looking for you. You're in big trouble, man. You should turn. This is in Rhode Island. You should turn yeah, yourself yeah. in. He goes, oh, uh, my lawyer, uh, so and so. You know, it's all a miscommunication. I said, Nick, you're in big trouble. I said, by the way, Nick. I said, I talked to Catherine a couple. I never told him what mm -hmm. she when he left when he got kicked out of Dayton, Ohio, or whatever. However, they told him to leave and threatened her. He come back to Rhode Island. I never told him a couple years back that she had called me and said. He's abusing me, stealing my money, stealing my family members' ID, identities, doing credit card fraud, all this crazy shit she told me. So I was like, wow, but I never told him. Now I blow my stack. I said, listen, you fucking cockroach. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Let me back up. I shouldn't swear. I apologize. No, you, you want me to tell you how I told him? Go ahead. I really don't want to swear. I, I I feel horrible. All right. Be, be you. That's what we want. Yeah. So he, he, he calls me. And uh, so after we had the big blowout, I didn't hear from him for like two weeks. But everybody's looking for him. Every agency you could think of, right? He's looking for this kid. 
a sexual assault, allegedly yeah. rape, allegedly all this crazy shit, identity fraud, mail fraud. They're looking for him because you know shipping shit through the mail. FBI's after him. Yeah. So he calls me after two weeks. He goes, Rap, Rap, oh, I'm dying, I'm dying, Rap, oh, I just want to tell you I love you. And my blood is boiling. Oh, now, this is the cancer, right? This is the this cancer. This is the cancer. Okay. I and said, by the way, by the way, real quick, Coogan, the audience loves you. The comments, they're like, we love this guy. Keep being you. Love this guy. They love you. So well, I apologize for the swearing, but oh, they love it. <laughs> this cat had my blood boiling. So I said, Nick. I said, you're dying. I said, what's wrong with you? He says, I got lymphoma. I'm dying. I'm on my deathbed. I'm dying. I said, two weeks ago, you, I'm sorry, <clears throat> two weeks ago, you were healthy as an ox. Yeah. I said, if I had the FBI, state police, U.S. Marshals, local cops looking for me, I'd fucking tell you I was dying too. <laughs> and you should die. I said, you should go kill yourself. I said, because they're all looking for you. They're going to get you. I said, you ever hear the long arm of the law? They're going to get you. And he didn't want to hear that. And he was just, he went into, and it reminded me of him arguing with the judge. He didn't want to hear anything I had to say. There was no compromise with this. I'm dying. You understand? I'm on my deathbed. I'm on my last breath. I'm done. I said, fuck you, you cockroach. Cockroaches don't die. I said, you're a cockroach, Nick. You fucked a lot of people. You hurt a lot of women. Your wife told me everything you did to her. She's lying. I just want to tell you I love you. I love you. I said, fuck you. Have a nice death. And he hung up on me. Then I see the state of Rhode Island is recognizing this kid for reforming DCYF and his obituary, not in the Providence Journal, because the Providence Journal, I believe they need a death certificate from the medical examiner's office. So let me let me just give this some context. So right now we've the, the, Brian's talking about January 2020. Now we fast forward to February 2020. This is when Nick has now faked his death. Because after he just found out that the FBI was looking for a state of Rhode Island, essentially everybody, everyone in the whole fucking country is looking for him. And uh, this is probably his, now his escape route. So go ahead. Take us to February. Yeah. <clears throat> right. Um, so I start here. And, and let me tell you, I was nauseous. Yeah. It was everywhere because Nick hit all the circuits. Like I said, uh, the Promise Journal didn't um, believe it, I don't think. I don't think they had, I don't know if there was an article in there, whatever, but um, he wrote his own obituary and sent to mm. all the local papers electronically yeah. from Westerly, Rhode Island to Woonsocket, you know? All the papers, the local papers, Nicholas Alaverdi passed away, uh, champion for the kids and this and that. The talk shows were talking about it. I was so mad. I called every one of them myself personally, even a big host, John DePietro, the John DePietro yeah, show. No, John, yeah. I said, John, this kid's a bullshit. He goes, Cougar, let it go. He's dead. I don't think it, I don't think so. You're getting all worked up. I called Channel 10, 12, 6. I called all the major reporters who covered it. I said, You guys, you're gonna this kid's a bullshitter. He's he's a con artist, he's a rapist, he's a, a sexual assault, he's a predator. Yeah. Nobody wanted to hear it. Nobody wanted to hear it. Then all of a sudden, fast forward, he's in um, Scotland, I guess, and he's in the he's in an incubator or uh, whatever device he had. He was dying. I heard how they really found him, not only because of his fingerprints and his tattoo by Interpol, which they did compare his fingerprints and his tattoos. I mean, you kid out in DNA. Yeah, but you know what? He only took some classes or some bullshit at Harvard. But he had a Harvard tattoo. You know, he wore like a badge of honor. Like he was, yeah, yeah, and I yeah. asked him, how are you doing? Oh, I'm, do I'm top of my class and this and that. And he told me he graduated from Harvard. You know, all through, you know, don't forget, this is from 2000 to present. I mean, this kid got a lot of bullshit in between. And um, he's got a picture, and I got it on my phone. I screenshot. He got a picture with President, uh, Vice President Pence. Pence. Did you see? Yeah. Did you yeah. see that? Yeah. This, this kid, he's getting pictures with everybody and anybody he could. Higher power. He's he, uh, he's going to the. Uh, he's with the mayor in Dayton, Ohio. I saw the YouTube that uh, I don't know some bullshit. They honor them over there, but um, this kid had a lot of bullshit. So when he, so no one believed me. So I get two text messages simultaneously, one from Tom Mooney from the Projo, 
and I get a text message from John the Petro. And John the Petro goes, Cougs, you're right, he's alive. <laughs> I got chills right away. I was like, like Yeah, I told you. <laughs> so I'm trying to call him on his phone like a bat, trying to call, yeah. trying to call. He was in his in his talk show or whatever, but he ended up calling me and goes, Ryan, you were right the whole time. I'm sorry. He goes, We all thought he was dead. I knew he wasn't dead and I didn't give up and I kept calling. But at one point I, I just said, no one's listening. What am I going to do? So how did you come to find out that, you know, he, he escapes, he gets over to Scotland, he marries this lady and we're going to play, I, I got to play some videos and have you react to him here in a second. But I, he goes over, he marries this lady that has, seems like she has a little bit of money, but she also has some problems of herself uh, dealing, I guess with the government. So some bad business dealings. But how did you come back around into this? Uh, and how did you find out that this Arthur Knight over in Scotland is is Nicholas Rossi, a.k.a. Aliverdian? Did you get tipped off or how did you start hearing about this? It just <clears throat> hit the media. It just hit the media like crazy yeah. that they like, found I him. that guy. Yeah. And so he was he was saying, so I sent them all his pictures because I got a bunch of pictures. Most of the pictures that are out there in the media is from me. The yeah. scar on his eye. So uh, Tom Mooney from the Projo said, hey, you want to come down to the Projo, my office? We're going to interview. They, uh, Sky News is interviewing Aliverdian. I mean, we're going uh, to play uh, that so people can see it, too. I want to play. Yeah. That. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he said, were you willing to come down and confront them? I said, absolutely. I'll come down. So I go yeah. down there to Providence downtown. And he and I are watching the interview, but Nick doesn't know that Sky News is letting us watch live. And we, we're live. He oh, don't know. Oh, nice. So he's like, <laughs> <laughs> I said, this fucking kid, I said, I could have punched him right through the TV. I was so mad. My blood's boiling. So then they and then they, they finally, and I think the guy says, hey, uh, Brian Coogan wants to talk to you. And. I said, hey, Nick, how you doing? Uh, I said, I'm the Irishman. You're not. I said, you know, you're a bullshit. Whatever I said. I forget exactly what I said. And uh, I said, look, he's got a scar on his eye. That's Nick. And then Nick was like all just like out of his mind. And then the guy from Sky News didn't want to blow, keep interviewing him. So he cut us off. And that's that's what happened with that segment. Yeah, let me pull up. Uh, I got a photo here that I want to show everybody. So I did a little before and after today. And, uh, you know, what you can see here is traits about, all right, so this is, this is, uh, Nick on the, on the before, this is probably, you know, maybe a year or two before he did his little escape over to, to Scotland and turned into a, a fat Harry Potter over there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the things that I looked at that totally lines up, just looking at him, you know, the creases here and the smile lines, he's definitely got that. I know in this picture, he's not smiling, but he still has that same tooth gap. Uh, yeah, and, and you said on on one of his eyes he's got a scar over there. It's kind of hard to see because yeah. he has the glasses. But that's all the facade that this guy has put up. Put the beard on. He's got the glasses. He's putting the fucking oxygen mask up so you can't tell who he is. And it's just it's unbelievable. But I mean, that's the guy. It's come on, cool. Oh, that's him, right? It's him. He can't he can't change his hairline. He can't change the scar in his eye. I don't need the fingerprints in the. I for over twenty decades. I've known this kid. I know his actions. I know how he. I know how he likes to um, uh, change his identity. Um, but what your audience needs to know, Brian, is he's very, very he's small, right? Yeah. He's very dangerous. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying how he assaulted the women because I wasn't there, so I can't say. But you know, I've heard all sorts of stuff, allegedly drugging them, wow. whatever. So there's so many women out there. See this? See how we're talking now? Yeah. Every time I do an interview or talk to someone, there's women that call me, but they don't want to be identified. Wow. And they don't want to talk to the the media about it. Yeah, yeah. I've had women call me from all over that he assault allegedly he assaulted them, drugged them, whatever he did, got in their house. And they couldn't get rid of him. He was like a cockroach. What? He wouldn't. He wouldn't leave the house. They, once he get to know him, he started coming over. I mean, look what that poor girl Miranda. He met her for two months. Next thing, he's marrying her after two months. But he's so aggressive. And again, you think the kid's three hundred pounds, six foot four? Yeah. You 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 don't understand it unless you see it. And I saw it at a young age when he argued with the chief judge. And the chief judge was a big guy. He passed away. Uh, uh, but he was a big man and he, he could get mean, but Nick went head to head with him. So when he gets in people's homes and in their lives, he, he, 
you can't get rid of them. It yeah. doesn't leave. Let me ask you, and before we pull up some of these videos, and I'd love to have you react to them. Um, let me ask you, did he ever display any of these traits before, kind of changing his appearance or manipulating who he is or putting an accent on or anything like that? Did you ever see any red flags along the way in your in your time of knowing him, like what, 20, 24, 25 years? Yeah, so he would try to be like uh, – he would try to look like guys like um, – uh, remind me of Martin Scorsese with oh, the glasses. Yeah. yeah. He would then he would dress. He'd wear a ball cap and he'd have a plaid shirt like Brown University. Right. He, um, businessman. Uh, one minute he has slick back, next minute it's potted to the side. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, I've always had the same look. You know, yeah, I don't right. know about you, but I've always kept this. I've always clean shaved. I always pull my hair back short around the sides. This kid would grow it out. He'd want to look like a college kid. He'd want to look like Brown University. He used to wear the Brown University sweatshirts. Uh, he would wear the Hobbit sweatshirts. Wow. And I'm the one who called when I finally was a registered sex offender. Yeah. And I called Brown University police where he used to charge his car because he had an electric car. Um, and I called him. I said, listen, this is the plate number. When he left Dayton, Ohio or Utah, wherever he came with, he came in a he came in a um, a U-Haul truck and he had his car on a um a dolly. Yeah, like, yeah. And when he showed up in Rhode Island, uh, he asked me to meet up with him for lunch and I met him. I said, Nick, the whole side of your car is wiped out. It looks like he stopped to get gas. Yeah. And you know those big yellow poles on the side? Yeah, he hit, yeah. But he argued with me for 20, I wouldn't have let him get away with anything. I said, Nick, you hit a a pole at a gas station. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. Someone side swept me on the highway. <laughs> Nick, I'm in the tone business. Been around cars my whole life. It's all that yellow paint, and it's just smushed all the way down. I said, "That's yeah. not." He tried to say it was a school bus. I said, "Well, school bus is higher." But anyways, um, he um, he would argue with you and argue with you, and uh, so he showed up in a U-Haul truck, and uh, he had I, I want to say twenty, thirty thousand dollars in electronics. Uh, you know the big plates, uh, glasses that the president used the prompts to read off of. Yeah, he had he had a replica oh, desk. Awesome. He had, a he, had a, uh, he had a, what's that? It's the teleprompter, right? The teleprompter, yeah. He had yeah. several of those. He had a replica of President Kennedy's desk. It wasn't printed, but it was a replica. He had portraits of President Kennedy. The American flags had all the gold fringe around it. Wow. All this kid, he, he had all sorts of electronic equipment because he was trying to do lobbying and whatever he was doing in Dayton, Ohio. But yeah, I, I just, the, the, you, there's so much to tell the audience and I can't, I can't get to everything, but... So let's do this. I'm going to pull up a couple of videos here. I'd love to hear your your reactions to some of this and uh, how preposterous this guy is. Brian, can, can you just talk to your audience one second? I got to plug my phone and, and charge it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, no problem, Brian. Give me take one second. Time. Yep. Take your time. All right, guys. So uh, thank you all for being here. If you can just do a uh, just take a quick moment, smash the like button there. I would appreciate it. We're really enjoying having Brian here on the show, and. Uh, you know, very nice of him to come on here and do this for us. So uh, we'll just wait back. It's no problem. We'll we'll, we'll take a pause here. Uh, and mm -hmm. it's great. He's a very busy guy. I appreciate him taking the time to do this. Like I said, Brian and I talked uh, very briefly about a week ago on the phone, about 15 minutes. And, um, and uh, it was really nice that he could do this for us. So we'll hang in there a little bit. <clears throat> Everybody's loving it. Great guests. They say great guests. Can't wait to see his reactions. This is fantastic. Uh, Mascus says, I knew this was going to be a good one. All right. Uh, the audience loves you, Brian. They appreciate you doing this. They really love it. So well, let's I, I, I want to I thank them, but they got to keep in mind that um, this is really, truly about the victims. And and I describe, you know, people say, oh, like a, a tornado or a train, this and that. The Kawi comes in. Nick's the kind of person that gets into your life, and he's done it to many women. If you've ever been on a boat and you're pulling into the uh, the uh, the harbor yeah. and there's boats all on the, on the docks and it says no wake zone, like five yeah, miles per hour, <laughs> this kid will come in like the Titanic 100 miles an hour. That's how he comes into your life, and he's very aggressive. And he doesn't take no for an answer, and he intimidates people. He, you could see how he's doing all these interviews. He's a he's a nasty, crazy guy. And he's listen, I'm not saying he murdered anybody, but I tell you what, 
the dangerous guy. Right. He's yeah. And, you know, and, and that's the thing that we do here. And I want to make sure that, you know, everybody and, and everybody that does follow my channel, uh, you know, they understand that we ex we expose scammers, fraudsters. We want to get that information out there. So these people are stopped and they cannot continue to uh, do this to other other victims. But let's do this. We'll pull up a video here. I'd love to hear your reaction. This is the oh, oh, that one, the, the, the dramatic here. <laughs> and uh, we'll get some reaction here from you. We were once a normal family, but thanks to the media, our lives have been interrupted. And we'd like privacy, and I would like to go back to being a normal husband. But I, I can't, because I can't breathe. I can't walk. Uh, people say, that's not. Let me try to stand up. Let me try to stand up. Exactly, exactly. What do you say to, to someone who believes that, that you are Nicholas Oliverdian? I am not Andrea. I am not Nicholas Oliverdian. I do not know how to make this clear. What do you say to people who say these are crocodile tears? He's putting on a show. This is all an act. <laughs> oh, he got... Andrea, no, that's, that's a low blow. That's a right low blow. Unreal. Get a reaction from you, Brian. What do you think? So two things. When he went to go stand up, you see how he had the power to lift himself yeah. up? Yeah. People that can't walk or, or whatever, they don't have – He's he actually lifted himself up. Then he went, oh, oh, oh. oh. Yeah. Uh, and mind you, Sanford and son, Elizabeth, it's the yeah, big I'm one. Coming. I'm coming. I'm coming. <laughs> so um, let me ask you, though, when you hear this voice – does it, is it, it's Nick's voice, right? Are you, he, you're hearing it. They... Yeah. So it's not only Nick's voice, Brian. He did that to me when he was 15 and a half years old. <laughs> you know, and crocodile, no tears. <laughs> you know, um, he did the exact same thing when he was 15. So that's my reaction. That's Nicholas. The voice. That's him. Easy. Um, but when he, when I remember I said he came in and bear hugged me, I felt like I got hit by a linebacker. Yeah. That was Nick. All right. Well, let's do a couple. You don't mind if I do a couple more, right, and have you do some reactions? Do whatever you want. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's play a couple more here. I, I, I in uh, This one is, I think this is the Sky News interview. So we're going to see that towards the end, the one that you were involved with. And then what I'll do after this one, I'll do one more, and I'll pull up the actual um, – the, the interview that you had on the Providence Journal, and I, I'd love to, to hear your reaction on that one too. And again, Brian, thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate it. And I love the fact that, you know, through this interview, you keep saying, I'm doing this for the victims to, to let people know about this guy. And I really do appreciate that. You're a stand-up guy and, and, and thank you for doing this and taking the time. He's a, he's a bad guy. Thank you for exposing him. Help. I don't have this kind of social media outlet to do what you're doing so you yeah. get a lot of credit for letting you know people really there's a lot of victims out there so the more we get this out there the more people can come forward i mean he took about forty thousand dollars alone from the lady in canada that lady is a beautiful businesswoman and he screwed her but go ahead i'm sorry yeah yeah absolutely no thank you thank you all right let's play through this one i'm not what mr rosie at okay, all then. i'm not the name okay, well, it's well, just, the game well, is well, afoot well, it's already started this is this is the extraordinary story of Nicholas Rossi, a fugitive who American prosecutors say faked his own death. Now that's how you knew him, right here. Right. Mine Scorsese look. Yeah. This is him back in Rhode Island. Now, how old was he here? He's like 15, 16 years old. Um, I think that's when he's testifying. I think he's about 18 or 19 when wow. he's thinking. So the funny thing is, you see that right there? I believe that was in uh he was in the committee room. So I get a call from the Rhode Island State Police, Connor O'Donnell, I believe his name is, yeah. detective. Good guy, hardworking pit bull, would not give up on this kid. He was on this kid like, woof, white on rice. So he called me and he says, hey, can you help us catch him? So I said, yeah. I said, let me see, you know, I'll see what I could do. So I call up the state house. I call my friend in the governor's office. And, you know, he has a pulse on all the bills that are going to pass the legislation. So I call him up. And uh, I said, hey, so-and-so, uh, the state police are looking for Nick Oliverdian, Nick yeah. Rossi, whatever. Yeah, yeah. He goes, Brian, he just testified downstairs. Let me look downstairs, see if he's still there. 
That's where he was. That's the day he was testifying. The state police were looking for him. This kid got balls like you wouldn't believe. He's he got out of there. He got out of there in time. He was, but he was. He wanted. He he didn't even have to go. That bill was going to pass, but he had to go and testify. He had to make an appearance. You know, the state police are looking for him. He had to slip in the state house, testify, and get the hell out. Unbelievable. That was a that that's in a committee room. That wooden door behind that's the committee room door right there. So one of my one of my viewers, I'm pulling the chat up here. Uh Megan says, uh talking about you, she said, This man is an absolute gem. What a great guest, Brian. Very much appreciated to have him on. So thank uh, you. It's, it's a fascinating story. All right, we'll play through a little bit more of this and, and we'll get through this. Wow. The Scotland. Look at this. It began when he was spotted and arrested in a Glasgow hospital while being treated for COVID. He claimed he was Arthur Knight, an Irish orphan, but a Scottish judge has ruled he is Nicholas Rossi. This is 12. And there was too that score skate, you know, this the Martin Scorsese look. Unbelievable. Yeah. Rossi's case made international headlines. Authorities say a Rhode Island man faked his own death and then hid out in Scotland. A story so bizarre it felt like a film script. Yeah. Your oxygen mask is not connected. So I have to hold his full weight. Do you see? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> he protested he was the victim of mistaken identity. I can't make it any clearer, Stephen. I am Oliver Knight. Arthur Knight. He claimed he'd never been to America, but across the Atlantic were people who saw through the performance. You were always absolutely certain it was him. 100% I was That's the worst. Cool right there. I've known Nick 22 years. I know him better than anybody. In Rhode Island, people knew. Well, how long? Do you know how long ago this interview was? Uh, it was um, when they caught him. So two years ago, maybe okay. two years ago. Bossy is Nick oh. Aliverdian, a child welfare campaigner. Politicians even paid tribute to him when they were told he died. I'm in the memory of my friend. I guess some of the people may know him also, Nicholas Aliverdian, who had a battle with cancer. An obituary that appeared online okay. claimed Nicholas yeah. Aliverdian had been cremated and his ashes scattered at sea. His final words, fear not, and run towards the bliss of the sun. In reality, Rossi was a convicted sex offender who'd fled to the UK and morphed into Arthur Knight before COVID stopped him in his tracks. Once we determined that he was in a Scottish hospital, we were able to... Stop it right there for a second. Yeah, no problem. So that guy, Levin... Yeah, well, I, I, uh, he was a prosecutor in uh, Utah, and Nick from Scotland Island. I don't know where he was. He put a vicious campaign against this guy that he was, uh, he was a cannibal. He yeah, was, oh. he was fucking. He said he was fucking eating humans. Yeah, and the story grew legs. Yeah, and the guy lost his election. He can hurt a lot. I'll never forget. He told me, uh, I don't know, maybe. One of his drunken stupors, I don't know, maybe 10 years after I know him, we started talking. And he said, if he knows your mother's maiden name and your date of birth, he could ruin your life from his bedroom with an iPad. And you There's said, a perfect example. There's a perfect example of what he does. That guy lost his election because of him. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to cut you off. But you, you were telling me uh, when we first talked that this guy was so smart that he would keep folders on his phone of all the information he gathered about people, right? And would record their phone calls. So Nick, Nick did everything through uh, Apple. And I, I mean, I have, I have an Apple phone. I have a Samsung and yeah. uh, um, I barely know how to use it. Honest to God. But Nick 15 years ago, record the conversation and put it in a file on your phone and his phone. And if you said something to him, he goes, you want me to play the tape? Want me to play it back for it? You promised me this, and you promised me that, and you said this. He was so manipulated. He felt so bad for him. But he would, he uh, he recorded every phone conversation. He labeled it and filed it into his Apple iPad, whatever, okay, file, right. whatever he did. But, yeah, yeah, that's what he would do. Wow. But if you, look, if you look at every one of these pictures yeah. and every one of his interviews, right, different hats, different suits, a Damn. robe. A beard. tie, a beard, yeah. no beard. Um, he's skinny, he's fat. That's all he does. He 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 constantly changes uh his appearance the best that he can. Wow. All right, we'll play through this through one. Through photographic uh confirmation and DNA that we had our man, so to speak. 
Then later on, I find out Nick is alive. He's in Glasgow. Is that, is that right? I said, I don't believe it. I was like, wow. He was arrested after hospital staff recognised him from an Interpol wanted notice. He said he was framed, even claiming that he was given identical tattoos to Rossi as he lay unconscious Are, on the COVID ward. the Harvard tattoo. Unbelievable. Yeah. That's the Harvard tattoo. We heard in court, though, that you were identified by tattoos. Is it worth seeing your left forearm? I just saved your picture. Yeah, yeah, but could I, could I, I mean, could you just raise Honestly, up? I'm exhausted. And I'm also just looking at the oxygen. Awesome. We're oh, yeah, getting yeah. A, okay, and we're getting a little bit low as well. There was one picture I saw. He's in red silky pajamas. Those are the same pajamas he wore yeah. when I was with him. That girl is beautiful. That's Catherine, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. That's the one you were talking about before, right? That he tied her. it to the bed. He locked her in the bathroom. Uh, he, he did mad, horrible things to that girl. Wow. She still. She told me that she's not a. You know, she oh, yeah. he he ruined that girl. Unbelievable. It was where the exact same. The exact. I don't think they. I know those were the exact same PJs. Slowly, the Arthur Knight charade has been unpicked. Nicholas Rossi faces serious allegations in the United States. Unreal. Wow. All right. I want to take everybody to an interview. I just want to, uh, Brian, I just want to introduce you to one of my sons. Yeah, yeah. So this is, tilt your head in. This is my son, London. You got to look at, you gotta, they can't see you. Just say hi. Nice to so meet he, you. Dog. He just came a police officer in the military. So, uh, he, oh, all right. Yeah, he goes. Congratulations. He's here. He's here, he's here for only for a week. Then he's leaving again. But uh, so um, and again, I had no kids at the time. Now I have five beautiful, healthy boys, and thank they you. all know. They all know Nick. Yeah, thank you for serving for 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 our country. Thank you so much. We appreciate yes. you. Yes, sir. Don't call me sir, please. I know <laughs> it's a military thing, <laughs> but I appreciate you and 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 thank you again for serving. That's thank you for your service. I appreciate that. Yes, all right, let's. Let's Thank do you. this. Let's let's do this with the audience. We'll pull up uh, one more one more interview. Now this is going to be Brian actually talking to Nick, and we were talking about this a little bit earlier. And uh, we'll we'll play through this, and then maybe if Brian has a little bit of time, some questions from the audience before we. I don't want to hold him up too much longer. I know he's with his son and visiting with his son. Uh, and, and if we can maybe take a couple of questions from the audience after, if you don't mind. I don't mind. I take them all. All right, awesome. All right, yeah, let's pull up this video real quick and we'll go through this. Now, this is this is Brian talking to to Nick on the phone and uh this will be this will be pretty interesting. Just tell me when to stop if you need to stop or anything, Brian. How you doing, Nick? Now, we can't hear Nick, but I can't really hear what he's saying. He said he says that he knows you. Nick, I'm the one that's Irish. You're not. <laughs> Coogan, I'm Irish. You're not. You get that scar on your eye. You have him move his glasses. You can see he has a little scar on the side of his eye. Do you see that, James? James, do you see the scar? Now, this is Sky News, right? Cool. Yes, yeah. I believe it's Sky News. Yeah. Is Nicholas Alaverdian? Nick, show him the two, two tattoos on your each arm. <laughs> Is he? I can't hear what he's saying, James. Uh, Mr. Coogan. Uh, yes. Uh, can I 
he's saying that he doesn't know you. He so he was denying you. you. Who? He was denying you, right? He was yes. like, I don't know who this guy is. Yeah. And I love how you're calling him out. You're like, come on, Nick, take off your glasses. Let's see the sky. Let's show him your tattoos. <laughs> and then, and, uh, go ahead, Coop. And then this is where they get it. I think this is where he gets upset and they, they cut me off because Nick, uh, he was going into a cabal. He's like, oh, I want to talk. <laughs> Unreal. All right, we'll finish this one up. Nick. We didn't give birth to you, but we were going to adopt you. I know who Nicholas Alabertian is, and that's you. And I'm going to be flying out to Scotland to prove it. How's that? I'm going to I'm going to testify that that's you, that scar on your eye. Can, James, do you see a scar on his eye? I love how you keep calling it out. That's good. It's better than a tattoo. Yeah, because scars don't go away. Yeah, that's 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 Nicholas Alabertian. <laughs> <clears throat> I'll tell you what, we can wrap this up. James, we can wrap it up right now. Look at his two biceps. He has a bot coat on one and a bird feather on the other, or uh, a uh, wing. Is he willing to show you his arms? No. He wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. Uh, are you, uh, would you, is that something you would do? He shows your arms. Your biceps. He's trying to say, you're trying to say he showed you his arms, his biceps. Look at his biceps. And I'll go away now. Go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Thank you. That's it. Bye, no, Nick. That's it. He was doing it. Uh. Yeah, that's that's what it, James was like. Because James wanted to keep going with them, and yeah. uh, he wanted to calm Nick down. Uh. How are you? Now you could see him, right? You could see. I can him. see him. Yeah. I'm holding up. I'm holding up my phone or iPad, yeah, whatever, yeah, yeah. whatever. It wasn't a big screen or something. I believe I was holding up. That's it. He left. Yeah. You want to show the biceps? He got all frantic. He got all paranoid. Oh, you know, <laughs> get all nervous. So he's obviously lying. The the scar on his eye is there, and uh, the tattoos he don't want to show. He tried to say, "Look, I got no tattoos on my arm," but he, the the he, she's going, "Yeah." So the um, but he didn't want to show his biceps. That's Nicholas. That's Nicholas. Uh, Nicholas Oliverian. Shit, man, that's good. Wow, good stuff for calling him out with the sky, Coop. Well, and it's funny because every time he did an interview, if you look with his interview or he was going to um, the courts or whatever, uh, he had like triple lays. He had like oh, all yeah. sorts of clothing, so you can never. He'd be. He'd say, "Look, I got no. I got no tattoo." And he's trying to lift up, and it's all buttoned up and tight, like the like a vault. You couldn't. Excuse me, you couldn't even slide his sleeve up. It was he wears layers of clothes. And the funny now thing he's is, saying, now ahead. he's saying they tattooed him in the hospital. Yeah, in the hospital. Yeah, they I'm went in and identified identified the same tattoos, identical tattoos. They tattooed him. What? It's so preposterous. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, and it's funny. In one of the interviews, when he did pull his pull his sleeve up and showed the arm with the sleeve, you can see where the tattoo was removed. I guess you can still see it. Yeah. And I, I, they, he did a pretty good job removing some of them tattoos because some he just didn't bother. He only like he had some on his on, on on his forearm, and but when it got from the elbow up, he still had he couldn't get rid of that. But um, at one point, I guess I don't know when he did it, but he had some he had some tattoos, you know. Now, do you know anything about his current wife that he's married to, or you don't know? Do you know anything? Or so here's what I'm told, and again, allegedly yeah. I'm told allegedly, that right. She and Nick did some sort of fraud together. Uh, and she has to stick beside him because she's under some sort of investigation herself. Nick could sink her and she could sink him. Uh, so that she they're like Miranda. In a pod. They're like peas in a pod. She won't give up supporting Nick. You think she would by now? Yeah. But supposedly, I don't know, and I don't know what they did. <clears throat> I'm I'm told this um, from a real good source that she allegedly did some sort of fraud with him. So he says, "Hey, you're gonna go. If I go down, you're going down." So she can't. She can't. She'll go. To, she'll go to prison over there supposedly. And she stuck by him. I gotta tell you, <laughs> she got that tank the size of a 
<laughs> you know, a propane tank, you know, it's like a it, propane tank. It's, it's the most unbelievable thing. Like <laughs> she's running all around. She and he's got that bitch in high gear and she's trying to run like a bastard, you know, and she's trying to catch up to him. At one point, they've been disconnected several times with the oxygen. He doesn't know it, you know. Um it's, it's like doing a big down and and it's like doing a bank robbery with someone, right? You run out to the car, you forget your partner, you know? And yeah. he's chasing you like a bastard, you know? Look, and <laughs> she couldn't catch up to him. And he had that sucker. Let's play, this. Let's play it real quick. We'll play, yeah. quick. We'll play some We're, of it. Check this out, everybody. This is done. And that scooter... Coop, it's one of the most fastest scooters I've ever seen in my entire life, too. It's all jazzed up. I never seen anything so fast in my life. You you thought it was a you had a uh, V under that bitch. <laughs> Look at this. This is a disaster. Watch this. Look at this. It's like a movie. It's a movie. Listen, this is going to be one hell of a movie. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Look at her. She's trying to pull him to, from going fast. Take it off. And he I think he starts pulling the peace sign here. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, I don't... You, you can't. It, it's... Yeah, but again, see how he's all suited down, layers and layers. Yeah. He's got he wears different hats. Sometimes you got sunglasses. Sometimes you got glasses. So I don't really need glasses. I just these are cheaters. Even though yes. oh, one twenty fives, right? But he's got like prescription glasses, thick glasses, not thick glass. I mean, his glasses and hats and his appearance is all different. His hair. I mean, he's a hot mess. Yeah. Let me. I'm gonna show everybody what this this <laughs> when he takes off with the scooter. I'm gonna. Fast forward here a little bit. Watch this. He is a mess. Look at this. <laughs> it just takes off. He's gone. Did you see the tires actually peel out? He pulled the whole shot. Holy shit. Yeah. So I want your audience to understand this other thing. Um, yeah. So when he went, so the, the sheriff, I mean, the judges in, in, in uh, Glasgow, wherever the courts, wherever he goes, they were actually called sheriffs. They wear the little wig. Mm. Um, so he was, they were trying to get Nick's DNA because uh, originally they took it illegally. And I, I'm all about justice and I'm all about everybody right. following the rules. You're <clears> going <throat> to follow the rules. The rules are the rules. So he didn't want to give his DNA, but they already had it. They had his fingerprints. They had everything, right? But they took it illegally. And they should have, but whatever. So what happened? He was going to court, going to court, going to court, fighting it, fighting it. Finally, finally the judge says, listen, we want it. We're going to take it. And that's it. I'm judgment against you. Boom. Mm -hmm. So he's, he was supposed to, he says, the next time you come to court, you know, they were give they were letting him uh, very freely and willingly to go get his DNA done and all that fingerprints, you know, and come back with the results. Because the judge gave him every opportunity to prove that he was out the night. But then the, the the sheriff, he got tired of it. So instead of, he says, if you don't come here next time in court with the DNA and uh, fingerprints or whatever, you're going to go to the slammer. Yeah. So what does Nick do? He he goes to, he goes to the uh, hospital. And he's in a hospital bed. Again, the whole time he's claiming he can't walk. Here's, what, here's how they ended up getting him and arresting him and charging him, if your audience doesn't know. Sure. He's in the bed. The doctor comes in with the nurse to take his blood um, and, and his DNA. He refuses. The doctor goes, listen, I'm taking it. I got a court order here. Right. It's the paperwork. We're taking it. Nick is so violent. Now, here's a kid that can't walk. He chases the doctor and the nurse down the corridor like a <laughs> madman. So the police... Get him, they tackle him, they arrest him, they take him to court. They now they charge him with assault. So now they don't need ah uh, the courts to say we want it. Now right. that you're criminally charged, 
they take your fingerprint, your DNA, and that's how they ended up getting it finally out of it because they charged him. And he, he was arrested, and I believe he never never got out of jail again. So my opinion, they kept, you know, people kept asking me, what do you think is Nick, what, what is Nick going to do? You know, like a dare, right? What is a dare? Fight or flight. They don't fight. What do they do? They flight. That's Nick. Nick was waiting for the opportunity, claiming he couldn't walk, was in a wheelchair, in my opinion, that he was going to screw. He was going to take off, just like he did in America. Yeah. I can't believe he snuck out of America like he did when they when he was wanted. Right. Think about it. Yeah. With everything going on with 9-11, this kid, some way, somehow, stole somebody's identity, fraudulently got on a plane or a ship, whatever he did to get out of America, he yeah. did it. Yeah. Under a warrant. People need to understand that. So he's a very dangerous guy. He's very clever. Yeah, and it's like now that you see him, you know, we've played played his. Uh, I was playing his most recent hearing back here. He's because a lot of people don't understand. He did ultimately end up getting extradited back to Mass, uh, not to Massachusetts, to to Utah, where he's facing charges. Uh, that was in January, and we've played a couple of his hearings. And if I don't know if you've seen him now, Coog, his hair is super long. He's got the super long beard. He's still playing the oxygen mask. No, I haven't seen. <laughs> Oh, you haven't seen that? No, uh, no. I gotta, I gotta play a little bit of that for you. So, you know, yeah, I want to see because I'm actually very busy. I don't really, and and I I I just rather if I see it, I see it. If I don't, I don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. Let me let me play a little bit of it for you. Hang only on. because Brian, only because I don't want to get like I'm already wrapped up new so thick so much that yeah. I'm I was going crazy. I, let me let me tell you, I was going crazy when he faked his death. You have no idea, like. Sure. I was infatuated with just finding this kid. I was hot. I was trying to find him on Facebook, social media. I was trying to do. I was putting his uh, profile back up. Of his, yeah. If you have that, as his registered sex offender. I I really lost my mind trying to find this kid. Yeah. Well, we appreciate your efforts, and thank God now he's he's in custody and in, in, in back here in America and under in jail where he needs to be right now until. But check this out. This is. I'll play a little bit of it here for you. This is his most recent. Hearing this is back uh, just about three weeks ago. Hang on. Six, seven, six, eight. Are you Mr. Rossi? Watch this. Cool. They're going to bring him up. Are you Mr. Rossi? Look at this fucking guy. Wow. Is that a yes? I'm having a hard time. I need to call them. Not you, Brian. Um, I think I'm going to have to have the jail restate what he said. I'm having a really hard time hearing him. My name is Arthur Knight. He's still playing the Arthur Knight. His name is Arthur Knight. Brown? Arthur Knight Brown. I can't hear. We want to have him state his name and data. Yeah, we can't hear him at all. Can you ask him? Can you please state your name and date of birth? Brian. Yeah. See how he plays the system. See what he's doing. It's like it's like an anchor. He drags on, drags on. He tries everything. This and he adds, you know, and then the thing is, I find this funny and very interesting. You know, knowing all the manipulation. So over in Scotland, he's. Arthur Knight, but now that he's come back to the U.S., he's now Arthur Knight Brown. So he's changing himself into another character now. You know Somebody what? You hey, you said it perfectly. He changes into characters. He goes deep into almost like a a movie star. Yeah. You know, he that's what he does. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, so let's do this. I, I know, I know, uh, we've had you for about an hour and a half and I appreciate that. Maybe we can take a couple of questions from the audience before sure. we let you go. Uh, if you all want to ask Brian, a, uh, Brian, uh, a question, just type a Q and then your question and I'll pull it up here on the screen. I'll read it to him and have them, uh, have them answer. We'll give, give him a couple here. So I got a question from Pierre. He says, question for Coogs. When is he finally, uh, when is he finally? When he is finally sentenced, will you go to the sentencing? You know, it's funny. I thought about that. Um, I thought about going. They may they may call me to testify. I don't even know. Um, they may have enough. Uh, or my my interactions won't be anything. It's, it won't be um, anything to do with the courts. 
Um, but I did tell some of the reporters, tell Nick I said hi. Uh, the reporters, because they all call me from over there, and a couple of them have, and he lost his shit. He went crazy, went batshit crazy. That guy's lunatic. I don't know that guy in America. Um, so will I go to the center, Taryn? I think I will. Mm. I think I will. I, I, I think I will. Um, while this was going on, I told Tom Mooney from the Projo, I showed him, you know, I said, listen, I said, I put the cash on the table. I said, I'm going to fly out to uh, Utah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, okay. I was going to go, like, I was, because I thought he was coming back a lot sooner, but right. he dragged his feet for two years. He held up this, he held up the system for two years, but I may go to the sentences. I, you know, I may. Yeah. And if you, if you, if you go, I, I might, I might go out there for that one. I think it'd be interesting. And if, if we can't make it, maybe we can get, uh, what, what they do is they do a zoom call and we can at least just sit in on it. I'd love to have you here on that. If we, if we don't make it out to Utah, we could at least watch it together and, and talk about it. It'd be great to have you back on the show. Uh, someone's asking in the question who signed this death certificate. I don't know that. I don't know if Coog does. Yeah. So like I said to you in the Providence, you know, Providence, Rhode Island, you need a death certificate in order to, uh, print the obituary, um, in the pro Joe on their obituaries. They never did it cause they never got a, um, they never received a death certificate, um, where the other local people like the, we have a bunch of local papers in Rhode Island and even in, even in Massachusetts over the border where they all printed, you know, Nicholas Alabertian, um, a champion for, you know, the kids in DCYF, right. overhaul DCYF, all these headlines. But the Proudness Journal, from what I understand, never print, because I kept asking for it. I called the, I, I called the state of Rhode Island. I called down there and I said, hey, I said, you have, a, I want to get a copy of Nicholas Alabertian's death certificate. They said, well, it's, it's, we can't give you that. Um, but you know, I never saw it. In the, I never saw that in the Promise Journal. Wow. Yeah. And, and then apparently, it's it's him. It's 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 Nicholas that actually put out his own obituary from what from what I've researched. So he actually put that out there. I got a question from Mark. He says, "What made you want to adopt Nicholas?" And uh, besides, you're obviously a very nice guy. So what made you want to adopt him? So um, I had struggles when I was a child, and so did my siblings. You know, broken home, divorced parents. Um, sometimes Christmas was just another day for us. No heat, no hot water, just yeah. like all the other days. Um, so anytime I see kids struggling, uh, I help out. I also do a, um, a blood drive. I've given over, uh, five gallons of blood wow. since I've been given blood. And, uh, you know, some people give a lot more, some people up to 10, 20 gallons yeah. throughout their life. But I do a coat drive for the homeless. I, 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 uh, nothing new. I won't take anything valuable. I won't take cash. But if you have a used coat, scarf, if you have two gloves that aren't the same, but it's a pair, I'll take them. So when it comes to helping, I love to help people. Mm -hmm. But don't take my kindness or weakness because right. I'll knock your teeth out if I have to as well. <laughs> not, not, you know what I mean? Like, don't take advantage of me. Like, don't bullshit me. That's why. Nick boiled my blood when he said, you know, I'm dying, I'm dying, I got lymphoma, I'm dying, I'm on my deathbed. I knew he was bullshit. And that's why I was swearing at him. I lost my mind. But, you know, I do blood drives, food drives, um, you know, so I love to help people. And you know what's the worst, Coog, is that he faked the worst kind of death. He said cancer. Like, who the fuck does that? Who think who takes in and says, I got cancer and fakes it? That that's a very shameful person to do that because I'm sure everybody that's watching this podcast tonight or after this podcast, or even yourself, has known someone that's been touched by cancer, you know, and it's it's terrible. You would even fake that. Yeah. Um, I got a guy right on my street has cancer and he it's a horrible death. Uh, and he's beating it though. Actually he's beating it, but I ran into him at a uh, home Depot and he was a plumber and, uh, I saw him, he was skin and bones. I, <laughs> I thought he was going to die. He was dying a horrible death. Well, you know what? It's been three years and he's, he's come back. He's still a little frail and stuff, yeah. but cancer was such a horrible death sentence. And here's his kid saying, I'm dying of lymphoma. Oh, you know, and, and, you had to be in my home to 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 hear him say that and me lose my mind. Unreal. So I got a question from Drew. Uh, Drew, Drew. I'm sorry. Drew says, uh, 
Uh, Coogs, other than Ro uh, Rossi, have you ever experienced any frauds uh, in your professional life? Uh, any frauds? Um, uh, the only the only fraud that happened to me, and the only one that I know of, is uh, when one summer I was pulling up to the house, and my wife was at the front door with the cordless phone in her hand back then, right? And uh, and she said she's screaming from the door. She's like, "Do you have your credit?" I'm pulling in the drive. I didn't even know what the hell she was saying. "You have your credit card. You have your credit card on you." I was like, oh, "Yeah." I put the car park. I said, "Yeah, right." Somebody in Walmart in like uh, Ohio. I don't know, not Ohio. Um, somewhere out in the, the middle of the united states they were buying 10 playstations with my credit card number so um other than that no but um i caught a bank robber with a gun you could look that up he held the whole oh, bank wow. up i chased him down i pulled another guy out of a burning building fully engulfed in flames i went in the, the two cops boosted me up to go into the window to get the guy it's in the prominence channel so not fraud, but I've I've been I've come across you know you see something say right. something my yeah, my yeah. Answer is if you see something do something about it you know um, and you know my family members get mad I pulled a guy out of the Province River his car flipped over the bridge and wow. I dove in um, and uh, it was a Volkswagen it flipped over and I went in the water under the seatbelt um, but I've seen a lot I've been involved in a lot but as far as the fraud stuff no I don't know a lot about yeah. fraud. Uh, so I get a question from Tsunami. He says, Coogs, do you think Nick would be a leader in prison or would he have to watch his back? That's kind of an interesting question. So Nick, Nick is very manipulative. He's got a way to make you like him. Listen, he picks his victims. Nick is the type of kid that it, um, if he ends up in prison and, you know, he would promise the gangs. And Nick is dangerous. Don't let his size fool you. Mm. He knows how to win people over. He's a fucking con artist. He's the worst because he's using his mind, not his he, muscle. He's using his right. mind. He would have the bad guys doing shit for him. Uh, so uh, it could go either way. You know, they don't like people who rape women and, you know, you know, they all watch TV. I'm sure they might watch Dateline or, or, or whatever. And But if they know that he's a rapist or the, or the gods leak it out that he's a rapist and a, a sexual yeah. assault people. But Nick, um, he knows how to get people, smart people, mm -hmm. dumb people. He knows how to get them to do things for him. So uh, Dave's saying that he's made comedy. He said, you should write a book. <laughs> you should write a book. It's a fascinating yeah. story, Coog. Well, mean, just, um, just the hour I, and a half that we spent with you tonight has been unbelievable. Yeah, you know? just, yeah. yeah no, um, I, I could write a book, but uh, too many people are alive still. So, yeah. um, you know. I could write a book, you know, uh, but yeah. So people need to understand he's a bad kid though. He's just, you know, there's so much more stuff out there that either people don't want to talk about it. I know some other stuff. I'll tell you, I'll give an example. There's a rep that I know, a male rep. He had to claim bankruptcy because what Nick got his information, but he don't want to come forward. Wow. So AKS Coogs, are you related to Rob Coogan from the Coogan Eating and uh, Cooling Company? I emailed Brian, Brian, me, LTL, to do a show on Charlotte Lester case here in Rhode Island that John DiPietro has covered. So uh, Rob, Rob Coogan's my brother. Okay. He owns Ari Coogan Plumbing and Heating. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know anything about that case, so I I, I, don't. I don't know. It's the first I heard about it as well. I don't know any. I, um, I don't know what that case is. I don't know. Is my brother involved in it? I don't even know. But <laughs> well, I'm, I'll check out after the show. But uh, maybe they were just asking about this particular case, and and right, I don't know anything about yeah, it. Maybe I think it was a two part question, asking if he was your brother. But I don't think they're implicating anything. Your brothers are connected to that. But uh, and then Kiki is asking, you know, will you write a book? Everybody kind of wants to hear your story, so I don't know. You're getting some 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 book vote <laughs> here, and and like Cook said, you know, maybe down the road this is something that he he does. So. So, I mean, you know, I, I'm not going to lie. I've thought about it. And, uh, again, I, you know, including my brother, Bobby, um, we grew up very, very hot in life. And my brother's very, very successful. He's, uh -huh. he's, um, he's done very well in business. Um, uh, doing, 
you know, coming from what we came from, um, you know, uh, my brother and I, and, uh, yeah, we've done well. We come from a broken home and, uh, I've done well. And, um, I have some horror stories, but it's funny. I think to write a book and then I hear other people's stories. I say, oh, my story's not so bad. Maybe I should write the book, <laughs> you know, but I, I mean, from how I, how I was born and raised to where I am today, it was funny because 9-11, uh, there's a guy named Chris Gilfillan who was an East Bronx police officer, but he was also in the National Guard. And he was pretty high up there. I don't know what it was, but uh, what, what his rank was. And he, he, as a patrolman, you know, my brother hung himself on our front porch. Um, it, it's horrible. He just, yeah. you know. Um, but I, I was standing behind Governor Kacheri at the time, 9-11, the way we lined up. I was on the end seat. So when the governor's speaking, my chair was my my chair was right behind them. It, it looks like I was really close, but I was actually back a little bit. Right. And uh, I'll never forget Chris Gilfillan was behind me, and he leaned over and he goes, "You're a success story. From where you came, it, I mean, I come from a broken home, and now I'm a lawmaker. You know, I was actually, you know, I made laws up the state house, and Pretty that's how good. I that's how I I mean, just the crazy story with Nick. There's some other crazy stories too, but um, don't have time to get into. But Nick is the craziest. Um, here's a kid that would sit on the house floor and read the bill. I mean, I'd read some of these bills. I said, this shit's boring as hell. You know, whether it's a, a seatbelt bill or a tint bill or a liquor bill, uh, any kind of legislation we're trying to pass, Nick's read it. So I tell everybody, Nick's a lawyer by trade. That's why he's so smart. Being up that state house, we created the monster. Yeah. He took his evil mind. And being up the state, I was reading the bill, sitting, I would fall asleep. Reps would fall asleep. That cop, Ray Hull, that was on there, who, who has the, had the legislation passed for, for Nick, think about it. He's got a cop. I think he's just hit the 30-year mark. He's still a cop. Ray Hull, and he's a state representative. He's a street cop. Yeah. He did the Hartford Projects. Like That was his beat at one time. He's no friggin' dope. And Nick got him to put in legislation for him. Unbelievable. See how dangerous that is? Yeah. It's the power of the mind. It's the power of the pen. It's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll we'll do this. I'm going to just pull up this one last one, and then we'll uh, we'll give a final thought from Brian. I, I, again, I appreciate you spending almost two hours with us here tonight on a Sunday. I know you could probably be uh, spending it with your family. I do appreciate this. Uh, Dave just says, uh, stand up, Guy Kooks. Thanks for spending time with us tonight. Uh, thanks, LTL. Amazing job uh, with all the way. Good luck to you and your podcast. So I'll do this. I'll turn it back over to Brian really quick before we let him go. Uh, final thoughts, Brian. You know, what what, what do you think here? And, and uh, you know, I think uh, I think Nick, in my own opinion, is going to have a lot of problems here in the next couple of months with all these hearings. <clears throat> well, I will tell I'll leave. I'll leave. I'll take a couple of minutes to uh, try to give you a summary. Yeah, of course. So Nicholas Rossi, Aliverdian, plus the other 30 names that he used. Um, I want your audience to understand that this is going to go on for another decade. Nick is a lawyer by trade, like I said. He's going to clog up the court system. Um, and you will be hearing about this for a decade, another, at least another decade. He'll know he knows how to file motions. And look, it took two years to get him here. Yeah. It's going to take another eight years. He'll be he'll file motion. He'll go all the way to the Supreme Court, federal court. He don't care. He's smart. He'll do it himself. He'll, you know, he'll only get smarter in jail because he's going to read the laws and the loopholes. And um he's so brilliant, it's scary. So, you know, look, he changed his accent, he changes his uh appearance, uh, he knows how to steal your identity. He could do it from jail. I mean, if he has a computer, um, he'll have people from jail. He'll be teaching people from jail. They should keep him separated from, from the inmates because he's going to educate them how to do, allegedly, credit card fraud, yeah. steal identities. So he's a very, very dangerous guy. Um, and uh, you'll be hearing about, I mean, look, if you watch Dateline, right? So I watch Dateline a lot of times, yeah. and it's usually a murder. Right. They're so fascinated with this kid. They did a story on him. You know, yeah. it's not even a murder, but he's it's and, and thank you, Brian, for, for picking this up and talking about it because this is a hot story. 
It's not going away anytime soon. Yeah. And we may find it, you know, more than a sexual assault at the end of this. We don't know. That's why I try to get it out there as much as I can because I want people to spread the word. And then maybe someone will come forward that he who doesn't really know what's going on in the world. But anyways, um, yeah. I just want people to know he's a very dangerous guy and he's um, – he, he doesn't have any morals. He don't care. He doesn't care who he hurts So who look again, that lady in Canada, we didn't even get to talk about her. I don't know her, sure. but, um, you know, it was on date, part of the dateline. I didn't even know until they showed it. He stole $40,000 from her. Wow. Oh, boy. And she's a successful, beautiful woman in Canada. And here he is in Scotland, right? He suckered her into giving her a picture of her passport. And then when uh, she wanted her money, if your if your uh, viewers don't know this, yeah. he says, "Hey, I got your passport. I'm gonna put this all over social media," and threatened her. So she was afraid to come forward. Forty thousand dollars she sent him, seven thousand, ten thousand, eight. He got up to forty thousand dollars. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Well. I'd love to check back in with you sometime as this kind of, you know, unfolds and we get some new information. Uh, I got your number. Let's keep in touch. Uh, I think you're doing wonderful things for your community. And thank you for coming out and really educating to who this guy is, because we're only really seeing, you know, news clips, news articles. But to get someone that has known this guy over the last 24 years and to come on a show like this and, and really put it out there and air it out there and say, hey, this guy's a dangerous guy. But the good thing about it, Coog, He's in jail and that's where he needs to be and he needs to face his charges. And I think, you know, I have trust in the system and I think like, I think you're right. It's going to take a long time to get this guy truly behind bars where he needs to be. Well, let me just say this one last thing. Yeah, um, you talk about how he's behind bars and stay behind bars. What I want you to know that you don't know and I want your viewers to know is in the state of Rhode Island, the charges that they had against Nicholas Verdi and Nicholas, uh, Nicholas Alberti and Nicholas Rossi. I just talked to someone in law enforcement last week. They dropped every charge wow. against them in the state of Rhode Island. And there were multiple charges, multiple investigations. And you can check it out yourself, uh, Brian. Uh, and you quote Tom Mooney from the Promise Pro Joe. I haven't talked to him lately, but I was told by a high ranking law enforcement uh, person that. All charges against Nick are dropped. Nothing. They're going after him for nothing. No assaults, not wretched as a sex offender. You name it, they dropped it. So in the, in the state of Rhode Island, he's got a cleaner record than you and I right now. Unreal. So I get nervous about these other states. And I don't know what Nick did. I don't know if he fought, whatever he fought, however he did it. But there were no charges as we speak today in the state of Rhode Island. And this is where it all started, Ant Street in Providence. Unbelievable. So what's next for you, Coog? What, you, you you said you might run again. I, I I don't know if I let the cat out of the bag, but you you were saying that you might run again, or I know I you run successful businesses. You're sex, successful businessmen, uh, and you were talking about maybe running again. Right. So if I run, it's because of the mental health issue. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, I told you my brother tragically hung himself. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, last Tuesday, my nephew hung himself. I'm so sorry. So uh, mental health to me is a big issue. I don't think that we pay attention enough to it. I don't think that um, we're not banging the pots and pans loud enough. Like I said, there's some guys in provinces at one particular camp. I buy them peaches. I buy them. Uh, again, I'm not a sucker. Yeah. I'm not a sucker. Um, I bring them peaches. I bring them clothes, jackets. I brought them a bunch of pallets the other day because um, they – and uh, people are like, what are you giving them pallets for? And I said, well, they, they build uh, a platform. They put the pallets and they put plywood. And then they put their tent on top because all the torrential rain that we were getting. Yeah. So a month ago, I brought them. I, they asked me, I said, what do you guys need? Uh, one guy says, well, I like to get a hot spot. And I said, no, 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 no. I'm not buying you a hot spot yeah. for your phone. Right. But I buy boxes of coffee, the the um, uh, the Joe's, the Big Joe's. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I buy them Domino's pizza. They know me up the street. Um, I buy like 10 at a time. So mental health, those people, like people like, oh, look at the bums. They're not bums. Some of those people yeah. just can't get their life together. Yeah. They don't know how to yeah. 
get up and go to work every day. They don't know how to shave. Like I don't, I don't leave the house unless I'm shaved and my hair's done. Yeah. Some of those people, they don't even shower. They don't know how to shower. And then they end up in the streets. They ended up on the bridge and they're trying to keep, they're only trying to survive. You think they really want to be there? Don't get me wrong. Some right. of them are drug addicts and right. some of them are yeah. bad people. Right. Right. But if you ever talk to them, like I have and got to know them, they don't want to be there. Doesn't you think I want to be here? You know, I got no education. Uh, my mother and father died. I've been on the street or, um, you know, I was living with my mother up until she was elderly and uh, she died and I got no home and I got no, no skills and no job. And I don't, I don't have a license and they fall into this, this rut, you know, it's like being in a hole and it's all grief. You can't get out. Mm. So if I may, if I run, it's really going to be about mental health and the homeless. Um, I, I told them I'm going to come back after the snow melts and for every trash bag that they fill up, I'm going to give them $5. Yeah. Again, I'm not a suck. I'm not just going to say, here's $5, here's $10. Right. So if a guy fills up five bags, he's going to get 25 bucks. There you go. You know, so I have a little, I have a dump truck. I said, I'm going to come back. I'm going to get some trash bags. In other words, you're going to work for the money. Yep. Make them feel good. Like they, uh, uh accomplished they something. It. Yeah. Yeah. But I also said that imagine if the state of Rhode Island, and maybe Massachusetts, a lot of those people, they take pride in their little camp and they want to clean it, but there's no way for them to throw the trash and there's no way for them to relieve themselves. So what do they do? They throw the trash and they relieve themselves outside. But if the state of Rhode Island and Massachusetts really want to take a hard look at it, give those people recyclable bins, the big bins and let the yeah. trash guy come. It won't be all over the ground. They, they, the guy told me, because you think I want to throw the trash on the ground? Where do you want me to put it? They say, you think I want to take a dump outside? Maybe we should give them porta potties. Yeah. Like help them with something. But there's some legislation that I was I was trying to gonna write up and, and for the homeless and the mental mental uh health people. And uh, you know, so well, I may you, run. Yeah, if it's in your heart, I say pursue it because you got a big heart of gold, man. I tell you, I lost my brother to mental health too. My brother killed himself. Uh, quite a few years back. And we, we actually talked about that offline. So, you know, if it's something that you believe in and I believe in that stuff too, I'm very strong and I talk about it and I, you know, we don't do enough for our vets here in this country as well. Oh. You know, all our veterans are, are left behind. They have mental health issues. They have, they have home, you know, they're homeless, our homeless vets. We don't do enough. We champion for that here on this channel. Um, you know, we really, uh, you know, it's just not enough done. We need to get the drugs off the street, all this fentanyl that's killing everybody. I mean, you and I can go on and on and on and on for days, uh, but it's 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 sad. You know, we, we don't do enough here and we need to do more here back at home. So again, I, I grew up uh, very poor. Um, I, I've done very well for myself all on my own. And so was my brother. My brother come a long way. Yeah. Um, and uh, I could take you over. To, I, so I own a couple, I own a few pieces of property. I could take you one of my properties right down the street. It's a parking lot. I have a fireman that used to be a fireman in State of Rhode Island because of mental illness. It just, it just happened. He's living in on my property in, in a vehicle that doesn't run. Yeah. So he got, he asked me to tow from the city of province cause he had to get out of this parking lot. I said, where do you want me to put it? He goes, oh, I don't know. Put on the street, warm up. I said, listen, <clears throat> for six months, it's been on my property. Mm -hmm. He lives in it. Mental illness. He was a fireman. Yeah. Just had a meltdown. I was, I have another kid. He was, you know, he had a hard life and he was on a live PD a couple of times. And when we had in these problems, yeah. he's in my pocket a lot. I got one guy over on, on one side. I have another guy on the other side of this property they own and they're living in the car mental illness yeah they don't, they don't exactly. know any better you know they don't they so i try to help anybody i can yeah it's sad you know and uh it's definitely something that we need to work here on this country i think you know and listen i don't want to get too political but i think you know in my opinion we spend way too much money <laughs> sending it overseas where we could be using that money back here at home and helping people and again mental health getting people off the streets getting these communities back rocking and rolling and getting these people some sense of 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 joy in their life and some sense of being because a lot of people don't have that inside them they don't feel like there's an, a way out and if we can get programs and put places in housing in place and people you know can work towards this and, and better themselves you know i think it would definitely improve america we don't do enough that here you know who right so <laughs> i have i have facebook uh so my facebook is coogan 
missed yep. the EPs, you know. Yep. And sometimes I, I go live on videos. There was a uh, a boyfriend and girlfriend in Warwick, Rhode Island. They were they asked me for a jump start because they, they went and got gas, but the battery's dead. So I live in matter of fact, it's two streets of my brother's building. They says, Girl told me around. He goes, Can you come give me a jump start for free? I'm homeless. Mm -hmm. I said I'll be right there. Yeah. I went away to walk. I gave him a jump start. I'm talking her and I'm going live on Facebook with this girl. Yeah. Then she tells me there's two other families in the park. This is the this is the um it's a state parking lot, like um when you uh, want to park your car and jump on yeah. a bus. So it's a parking ride. Then she tells me there's two other families living in cars. I have two different people living on my property. And then when I saw the news the other day, we're giving 95 90, billion. Billion. 95 billion. Did I get the number right? Yeah. Did you see that? Yeah. To the to the, and listen, I love Ukraine. I love in Israel. Yeah. It's it's right. sad what happened. Right. I've always felt take care of your neighborhood first, right. your city, then your state. Um, so $95 billion to these other countries, which I'm glad we're helping them. Yeah. Well, geez, let's throw a billion in this country to some. Right. Like, it's unbelievable that we don't take care of the, the people with mental health. And um, it's just, it's sad. But I'm going to, I may run, I may not. I, yeah. I mean, I'm busy. I got a lot going on. I have five kids, like I said. <laughs> um, but I would like to try to get some legislation passed. And I talked to some other reps and, uh, it just falls on deaf ears, you know, until I threaten to run against them, uh, you know, reps and senators. Cause, uh, you know, I know how to shake the tree a little bit, but, uh, yeah. I, I, you know, they're horrified that I may run. But again, if you want to go to my you get shit done, probably Coog. That's why <laughs> I'm a no nonsense guy. Yeah, Let's get it cool. done. Um, my friend told me a long time ago, my friend, Ken Foley, he's kind of like, um, a guy I look up to unbelievable. And, uh, he says, I don't give a F how you get it done. Just get it F and done. And I've always been that since I met I was like 17 when he told me that. So I don't care how you F and get it done. Just get it done. I don't care. And he's right. So, uh, screw the bullshit, but I, I go live a lot on uh Coogan, Mr. EP, uh, Facebook. And I help a lot, a lot of people, people offer to give me money. I will never take a dime from you, but if you ever use code, and you wash it and it's in good shape, I will come and pick it up. If you have gloves, scarves, boots. I had a friend of mine, um, uh, um, I can't even think of it. Pellucci, Pellucci, Pellucci is her last name. Yeah. I can't think of her first name. I'm so sorry. She goes, I want to buy like 30 brand new blankets for you. I said, absolutely not. I won't take anything brand new. I won't take anything of value. These people don't need brand new. If you have an extra blanket or sleeping bag or whatever, I'll come pick it up. Well, next so, time, um, I promise you, the next time I build up some trash bags of stuff that I'm recycling out of my closet, I'll give you a call. We'll meet halfway and I'll give them to you. Yeah, because you know those recyclable, I'm not recycling. You know those clothing bins you see on the side yeah. of the highway? Yeah. That's a big business. That doesn't go to homeless. Yeah. They what, that, what, they, yeah. What, what they do with that, mm. in case your viewers don't know, is they um they take those clothes, they go through them, they wash them, they separate them. Um, and they put them in shipper containers and they get 20 cents a pound. They sell them to third world countries. Yep. So we're thinking, you know, that's why I don't, I don't put any clothes in those bins because yep. there's a couple of bins that are for, um, for the people in their neighborhoods or their state, but yeah. most of those bins out there, that's a business. It's such a big business. Now you figure 20 cents a pound and shit. When you're talking a couple of million pounds yeah. of clothes on a shipment on a big cargo ship. That again shipped to another country the clothes like they go through them it's 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 a business but yeah, they, they don't a, a lot of those people don't get the clothes from my state and our neighborhoods yeah there's a boys home here in attleboro i always you know i want to, every spring summer whatever i'll get it together and i just physically go there and drop it because then i know it's going to go right to to a home you know yeah. and then the other thing is and i i know you're staying a lecture wrote long for me but the oh, other okay. my, my other thing that's near and dear to my heart is giving blood Mm -hmm. um, I've been in the tone business since 1988 and I told for the Rally state police at one time, East Providence police, Brown university police, um, RISD police. And now I told for Seacock police in Massachusetts, right over the line. Yep. The accidents, when people get bad accidents, mostly in the summertime, um, they, the amount of blood that they lose is unbelievable. So the blood banks, um, really need the blood for it's mostly for car accidents if you if you learn about it um people also i have one of my best friends yes i have blood transfusions but yeah. the biggest thing people lose uh when they lose blood is from a bad car accident and you we all know someone's been a bad car accident 
um, or they hit a tree or, you know, it's a fatal, but a lot of people that live lose a lot of blood. So that's, I, I've seen so many people lose blood. So that's why I'm big on giving blood because I, I, I've seen it on the highways. I've seen a girl have an arm ripped right off and blood. I mean, we need blood. If you can donate blood, if you can't get your wife, get your husband, get your best friend, we need blood in this country. God forbid if we had something that happened tragically um, in your neighborhood, you need that. We need that blood desperately. So please give blood if you can. Is but there? You, what's yeah, that? Go ahead. Go ahead bro. I was going to say, is there a specific place that you like to go? Maybe you can direct some people there if in the state of Rhode Island to give blood. Uh, is there a particular place you like to go to? Because maybe we can give that address and the information out. So I give to the Rhode Island Blood Center okay. because the blood stays here. Right. I'm told, and I don't know how true this is, but I'm told is I'm not going to mention their name, but there's I think sure. there's only one other one. Um, well, the Red Cross. Yeah. The Red Cross ships our blood to other countries. Yeah. We need our blood to be here and stay yeah. here. So, uh, the Rhode Island Blood go Center. Your, wanted, yeah, go to your local blood center. Yeah. 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 The Rhode Island Blood Center keeps the blood here. They don't ship it out. Um, the Red Cross, they're out helping other countries, and they all jump on a plane and give. We need our blood for our own people for us. And um, people don't know that. You know, it's important. It's a big business. They, they from when I say it, it's the blood sold. But the Rhode Island Blood Center, from what I understand, keeps 100% right here. That's why it's called the Rhode Island Blood Center. Um, it's a big business. You know, people don't know. When you start digging and learning and getting involved, they're like, oh, yeah, the Red Cross, they're great. Oh, yeah, give blood to them. They ship it out, whatever. But. Uh, please give blood, you know, find you are from Massachusetts. I don't know if you have listeners from New York or Ohio. Yeah, I have listeners all over the world. Yeah, so when you give blood, make sure it stays in your state. Yeah. <laughs> Ask, you know, where does the blood go? Uh -uh. Who Who's in charge of it? So, um, yeah. you know, there's so many issues that, you know, we, we, I just, so what I do, Brian, is I can't save the world. But what I do, I'm going March 7th to give blood. Uh, I just gave it uh, a month ago. Um, when I when someone says, "Hey, I got coats," I go get it. You know, give a coat, shoes. I can't go. I, I can't save the world, but I just do my little, little, little pot, just that little bit, and it's gonna go along. You know, one pint of blood could save three lives. Yeah, it's true. One pint of blood, and you'll see it on my Facebook. That is such a strong message. It's it's yeah, it, it hits my heart. You know, so one pint. Of blood could save could save three lives. So, um, yeah. And, and listen, I appreciate you reaching out to me. That when you reached out to me, I was like, you know what? Finally, a regular guy. You know, when you sent me your uh, your podcast, because yeah. I'm hearing all these like Dateline people, yeah, yeah. Sky News, National Geographic's uh, interviewed me for two days, the History Channel. Like you're a regular homegrown guy. I'm, you're I'm going to tell you, Bri. I'm you know I'm, I'm in Massachusetts. But I'm probably about ten minutes from you, so we're we're local guys, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I appreciate when I when you reached out to me, I said, "Well, finally, someone local." I got people from New York. I did some podcasts from there, um, all over the all over the place. Um, but you, I took a like or two, and they want the juicy shit, and then they just want to kick me aside. You know what I mean? It's like, what's this? What's that? And then boom, you know. Then you never hear from again. But you're a local guy. I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna. Uh, Join your podcast. And I promise you, I, I'm, I'm not kidding because I think one of my friends is watching. We were talking about this today. I have a closet full of clothes that I need to go through. I promise you in the next couple of days, I will go through them. I'll get them together. I'll give you a call and we can meet some, somewhere and I'll give you the bags of clothes so you can give them to, to people that need them. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I'll come get them. I'll, 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 I'll fucking meet you halfway. I'll, Don't worry about I'll, it. No, I'll, I'll come get him. I'm serious because, you know, the homeless really need it. And there's yeah. camps out there. And you hear some nasty things from people. I got I got a, a friend of mine. <clears throat> he was calling me crazy, calling me a loser for helping the people. He goes, oh, you're wasting your time, those people. I'm not mad at him. He, mm -hmm. he doesn't understand. So mental health is bad. And uh, we need to help. And, um. I'm happy to help out and, you know, I'll do whatever I can. Again, I'm no sucker. up. I'm, but it's funny because <coughs> when you go to Coogan, Mr. EP, my Facebook. Yep. And um, so um, and I dropped um, your link in there so everybody can see it so they can go there um, and check you out. So it's funny because uh, my, my fiance, Anna, she's yeah. actually a councilwoman right now in East Providence. She's 10 years younger than me. She um, 
She's the longest serving council person on the council right now, but she also works for the state of Rhode Island for the nursing program. She's the deputy director. She's also been at Rhode Island Hospital for 22, going on 23 years. She's a bedside nurse for neurospine. Mm. So, you know, we're exactly like very aggressive, love helping people. We get involved. She's got a couple of mental uh, health group homes in East Providence for older people. You know, we get like used belts for them, clothes, yeah. uh, electronics, because they only get like $50 to spend on themselves a week. So we, we do a lot, especially around the holidays for them. They have nobody. You know, they age, I mean, they're old and their parents died off. And, you know, if they weren't in these group homes, they'd be homeless too. So, yeah. um, but it's funny because on my Facebook, uh, I do some funny shit too. Like it's, it's not all like sappy stuff. Um, yeah. so a couple of years ago, uh, I got a call from uh, one of the motor clubs to get a guy in, um, Northern Rhode Island. They said he backed into a puddle. Brian, you would have laughed your ass off. We get there. He's not there. He's already home. He's cocked. His car's in this swampy pond. Frogs, tadpoles, these little, you know, and this is three in the morning, you know, and you put the, you shine the light on, you see these little parasites swimming around and shit. This was stagnant water. It was so cold. Hey, bullfrogs. Burr, 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 burr. You hear noises in the woods. I had this on Facebook Live, right? So I try to get my girl to go in the water. And hook the chain under the car that submerged. <laughs> oh my God, the funniest, funniest video I ever did. And I said, Show your loyalty. I thought you were right or die, chick. Come on, get in there. She goes, I'm not going in there. You know, there was some Paris because you put the, the high power flashlight on, you can yeah. see it, like, you know, Jeez, things that you oh. don't want to know it's in the water, right? <laughs> right. So we're Facebook Live the whole time, but it only lasts like 30 days. I don't think your, your, your stuff stays on there forever. No, my stuff does. It stays on forever. Oh, it does? Yeah, we're on YouTube, so it stays there forever. Oh, I don't have YouTube. I yeah, only have yeah. Facebook. Um, yeah, yeah. So I go live a lot. And uh, 3 o'clock in the morning, who comes down this dirt road? Didn't know we were there. Didn't even know the car, the guy's car was submerged in the water. It was um, DEM, Department of, My uh, Department of Environmental Management. Yeah, yeah. She's like, what are you doing? I'm like, what am I doing? I said, where did you come from? I said, it's three in the morning. Did you know where? She goes, no. She's like, you got your ID on you? I said, listen, I'm not giving you my ID. I'm the tow truck guy. I'm here. To, well, where's the guy at? You always, I wish I had could have saved that video. And uh, I had to go in there. And I had to go up to my waist. Oh, Jesus. Oh, that slimy water. My sneakers. It was, uh, you ever, if you, if you ever see the movie uh, where the kids get their leeches stuck on them, what was oh, it, yeah. leaning on me? Yes. I kept my girls like, oh, you're gonna have yeah, leeches on your, you're gonna have leeches on your private part. <laughs> I said, you're gonna have to pull them off. She goes, I'm not touching, and I didn't know, I didn't. But anyways, <laughs> but, but uh, Brian, thank you for everything you do. Listen, I'm an open book. You need me, you call me. Uh, I gotta have you back on again, and I want to tell you this, Brian. Anytime you need a platform, anytime you need a platform to get any information out. You are welcome back here on my channel, 1,000%. You need to talk about something, a political movement, something about the homeless, anything that you want to represent and put out there, you're always welcome to come back. And I'd love to have you back maybe here in a couple months once this Aliverdian stuff starts kicking back up again and, and have you back for some, some uh, for some thoughts. Yeah, I just I um I appreciate that and I will. But the biggest thing is that people give blood and, and give yeah. clothes. And, you know, don't look at the homeless people as scumbags, you know. Even if you want to throw stuff in a trash bag and drive by them and throw it so they can get it, you know, you don't have to have, because some of them are dangerous. Don't yeah. get me wrong. Right, right. So there's some bad people in those camps, but thank you for that. The platform's big. I mean, I may or may not run, but, I, I, you know, I got so much going on. But if you can give blood or help, to, just do your little part in this world, you know. Uh, they say, see, see, if you see something, say something. But if I say, if you see something, do something about it. Don't. Uh, so I appreciate it and, and I will, I'll, I'll use that, but mental health is big. I lost my brother, like I said, and then my nephew just committed suicide Tuesday. I'm so sorry. Um, and, uh, you know, mental health, it's, it's, we, you don't know what it's like. I don't know what it's like. I don't have it. Thank God. But, you know, I've had family members and I know other friends that have it and, uh, it's pretty sad, but, uh, and, and here's but, the thing, this is what I always say to everybody. And I want to get this out before we end the show. You got to look at your local constituents that run because you will meet 
constituents like this, like Brian, people that actually care about the communities. I think people get way too wrapped up on the national election. People like Brian are the people that are in your neighborhoods. They're living around in your area. And these are the people that you're going to want to check out and have conversations with. So they're the ones that run your community. And this guy's a stand-up guy. He's got a heart of gold. And uh, we clearly saw that over the over this last two hours. So again, yeah. Brian, I appreciate it. And I promise you, in the, in the next couple of days to a week, I will give you a ring. I'll have some bags of clothes and I'm going to donate them to you. We'll meet up and uh, I'll get those over to you. So, uh, and I appreciate it. And before, yeah. you, before you cut me off, there's one other thing that- Yeah, absolutely. Take it, your time. It, it might sound so simple to other people, but baseball season's coming. There are a lot of kids out there where their parents will not take them the best, um, the dick sporting goods yeah. and buy them that $300 glove. Matter of fact, their parents don't have any money to buy them any glove because some of them baseball bats are three four five hundred dollars if you have used sports equipment reach out to uh your so um central little league baseball we have here so i help i tell people hey you got any used gloves you have any used baseball bats cleats because there are some poor kids and east Bronx is not all poor people it's nowhere near them, believe me i tell you but it's, it's east Bronx is a people don't need money but they don't have money you know what i mean uh, it's a working class community, but yep. there are a lot of families that can't buy their kid a baseball and bat, you know? Yep. And, um, I'm very fortunate. I have five kids. I bought them the best of everything. And, um, I started when, you know, clean out my garage one day and I, I reached out to the local baseball and I said to them, I said, Hey, you guys need any, any gloves? We'll take anything you got. Anything. Nobody kids that can't even play all, oh, you know, they're sharing yep. gloves. Just, just getting a, a kid up fucking baseball glove you could change that kid's world because that kid may make it to the red sox one day the yankees yeah. but if he doesn't have that glove and get discovered to not play because he's poor his mother can't afford it he comes from a, a divorced home we all i'm divorced mm -hmm. i'm lucky that my ex-wife and i have a great rela relationship and uh my kids uh you saw one of them today he's a cop in the navy just graduated the other day to be a police officer but just getting a kid a baseball glove if you have any used Sport equipment in your garage. Don't throw it out. Yeah. Put your local your local sports people, whether it's baseball, soccer, even football gear. There's so many kids you could change their life just by giving them some some sports equipment. Honest to God. That yeah, and the thing you to think about it, I'd rather have a baseball glove in, in a kid's hand than a crack pipe or something like that, you know, or a gun, you know. Yeah. I, you know, let's give them yeah. baseball gloves instead of weapons, you know. Yeah, and you know, you give them that glove. I've I've been very fortunate again, a couple of them broken home. But I had people that in my neighborhood could identify where I was coming from and they reached out and they helped me with certain things. And I have a lot of role models and yeah. you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate to, to have what I have today. I'm very successful, self-made. Um, you wouldn't know it, you know, but uh, I come from a broken home. So I was that kid with no baseball glove, you know, I was that kid without a bat, you know, uh, no socks like that you know and i don't blame my parents my mother was a waitress her whole life my father's a truck driver you know it's just it's just tough life anyway it's just you know so but again a lot of people go through the same thing a lot of people a lot worse than me so i uh, brian i appreciate your time you need me reach out and uh we'll talk in person as well yeah we're i'm gonna like i said give me a couple of days to a week i'm gonna reach back out to you i'm gonna have a bile a bundle of clothes for you and i'm gonna i'd love to meet up with you and and, and get that to you Brian, if you could do a podcast, I'm sure you've got some homeless people around your neighborhood, mm -hmm. around your city. Yeah. If, you, if you can give those clothes to the people in your city, mm -hmm. there may be a, so in Providence, there's a bunch of camps. And the reason I, one particular camp I pay attention to is a, a guy my age that I grew up with who's living in one of those camps. So I like giving to this one camp, but they're all over the place. They're, yeah. they're, they're they're under loading docks. They're under the garage, uh, uh, highways, bridges. You, they're they're all over the place. But if you can bring those clothes to your people in your neighborhood, and anybody seeing this who's in my neighborhood, could, we could bring it to them here. Mm -hmm. If we all do our little part in our neighborhood, the world would honest to God be a truly a better place. And uh, you know, I'll take them. If you don't have someone in your neighborhood, I will take them. Yeah, and matter I mean, of fact, I'll go live on Facebook. I'll let them know it came from. Brian, uh, LTL, uh, true crimes. And, you know, I give everybody a shout out, you know, um, yeah, well, that, that I wanna, yeah, I want to meet up with you in person. I definitely want to do that. I'm going to do this guys. I'm going to drop Brian's, uh,
Hoogan's uh, link in the in there. If you want to connect with them on Facebook, if you have if you live in the East Providence area, the Rhode Island area, if you have some clothes you want to donate or some sporting equipment, reach out to Brian because he will get it to the right resources. He's a man with a good heart, self-made man, five kids. We learned a lot about him today and uh, knows uh, and has identified and confirmed that this is Nicholas Rossi. This is not some fictitious character, Arthur Knight. And, uh, you know, Brian, I, I appreciate, I appreciate your time. Yeah. And you know what? Um, I feel, I feel horrible because I think about Nick all the time and, you know, he's a monster, but I always say to myself, geez, if, if maybe if I did adopt him, he could be a federal prosecutor today. He could be a judge. He could be a governor. I mean, the kid is so smart, but you know, what happened in his childhood to make him the monster that he is. And I always felt like I, I could have turned him around. And I always kept in contact with him. Yeah. I talked to him for hours at a time for the last 20 years, you know, off and on. And I thought I was getting through him, but he was a monster that I didn't know. I mean, if Catherine never told me, I would have known. You know what I mean? So his wife and then all this, all this shit broke out later. But, yeah. but um, forgive me. And I don't mean to, to, to say anything bad, but you can't. I'm I'm just telling you, I don't know you from, from Adam. We just known today. Don't put that shit on yourself. I think this guy was a self-made demon. He knew what he was doing. And I get it. You want to, and you're the same as me, man. We want to save everybody that's around us. We always put, I know at least do, and I can't speak for you. I put everybody first before myself. And, right. Uh, and, and believe me, this guy is a bad guy. Like you said, a self-made demon. And I don't think as much as the, 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 the caring and coddling that you could have gave him could have changed him because I think he would have been an evil guy his his entire life and is clearly showing that. I'm sure you can find the the segment, whatever you call it, whatever you people call yeah, it. Yeah. The father, the stepfather, Nicholas Rossi. Yeah, we played He that. said, oh, you played it? Yeah. He said, hey, I, I saw a clip. I, I think I saw it twice. And I'm trying to remember what he said. He said, I beat his ass in Florida. <laughs> He said the kid's evil. He's evil at a young age. This is before yeah. even knew Nick. Here's a guy who took the whole family to Disney, and I guess right outside of Disney, he pulls him out of the car and he beat the piss out of him because Nick could get under your nerves. So here's a kid at a young age, the father, the stepfather, beat the shit out of him. I think he got arrested. Did he get arrested? Did he say that in the clip? I think he might have. I don't think they talked about it. I think they just said, can you confirm this is Nicholas Rossi Alaverde? And he's like, yep, that's Nick. So, yeah, I think. Yeah, that's but there was one, one, someone did an interview on him and he said, that kid's an evil, whatever. <laughs> he goes, I pulled him out of car. I beat the shit out. I was going to kill him. He said it. I was going to, I, and I, I was like, wow, that's how Nick gets you. He gets yeah. under your skin. And these poor women, when he gets in their houses and their apartments, he won't leave. And I've talked to a lot of them. A lot of them called me. Uh, like they'll see this show, they'll see Deadline, they'll hit me up on Facebook, and yeah. and um, they they says once he got in my house, I couldn't get rid of him. Unreal. But that's that's Nick. Um, he's got another kind of mental illness that I don't put up with. He's got a criminal mental illness, yeah. and that's what we, that's what we got to be careful. We can't get confused of mental illness and criminal mental illness because it's yeah. it's totally different, you know. No, you're right. You're right. All right, Coog. I appreciate you, bud. We're going to meet up here in a couple of days. I'll get some clothes together for you and let's meet in person and shake hands. I'd love to do that. It was a pleasure. And I, I appreciate your audience, you know, listening to what's going on and um, getting a little back uh, inside in the um, Nicholas Allegretti case. And they should, there's a lot of stuff out there. They should, uh, if this is the first time they're hearing about it, check it out, read up on it. Yeah. Brian, thank you so much. Thank you. And tell your son again, and, and I have to say this to you, thank you for serving. Uh, tell your son, thank you for serving. And congratulations. You told me your youngest just got his permit and he's excited. Yeah, about my son, Blaze. Yeah, Blaze. Yeah. He's a cutie. He's, <laughs> you know, they're all, they're all good kids. Cameron, Ashton, Sebastian, London, and Blaze are my kids. Yeah. They're all boys. Fantastic names, by the way, Coog. Yeah. I, I didn't want, I didn't want anything traditional. I wanted it, you know, yeah. uh, awesome. Yeah, so um, and my my ex wife, she's a Disney nut, so she liked uh, Sebastian the Crab. That's how my middle son got the middle name. I mean, that's how he got his uh, first name, Sebastian. But no, all good kids. I'm a great parent. She's a great parent, yeah. and my fiance, she's like a mother, like you wouldn't believe to them. So she does, you know, she's a nurse. She's a very caring, smart, street smart. You're not gonna fool her either. She don't put up with no bullshit. Anna Souza, and uh, and again, she's a councilwoman herself. So. That's great. Thank you so much. And uh, call me anytime you need me. 
We're going to meet up soon. I appreciate it. Have a good night and have a good uh, good rest of your weekend here. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks for reaching out. Bye-bye. All right, Coop. I'll talk to you soon. Yep. All right. That was Brian Coogan, uh, former friend of Nicholas uh, Rossi, Aliverdian, AKK, AKKKK, uh, uh, Arthur Knight. So has set the record straight, has confirmed that that is uh, Nicholas Rossi, Aliverdian, and uh, what a great show. What a great show. And uh, Brian's such a great stand-up guy. I, I, I could sit there and talk to him forever. And um, I am going to meet up with him soon, and I'll get some clothes over to him. And I appreciate all of you for watching tonight. I wish we had a larger audience, but the audience that was here tonight was fantastic. If you're watching this on replay, please make sure to leave a comment down below and give this stream... Uh, a thumbs up because we want to get this out into the algorithm. I know that this uh, this portion of the LTL can be, uh, this episode can be big. So just need your uh, participation on that. Watch it through, leave a comment down below, smash the like button. I would appreciate it. All right, everybody. It's late here on Sunday night, 1030 on the East Coast. I want to thank everybody for being here this night and supporting the LTL True Crime Podcast. Gosh, this is one that you didn't want to miss. And uh, I can't wait to have Coog back again. So thank you, Brian. I appreciate you, your kindness, and your uh, forthcoming uh, and, and letting us know about Nicholas Rossi Aliverdian. I really appreciate it. All right, everybody have a wonderful night. I will be back soon. I'll talk to you all later. Have a good night. Bye. LTL, true crime, we gone deep in the dark. Peeling back the layers, expose the hidden marks. From the streets to the alleys where the secrets lie. Getting into minds of the wicked, no alibi. LTL, true crime, unravel in the web of evil. No stone left unturned, we dive into the prime. Yeah, we digging up the dirt, bringing justice to the crime. LTL, true crime, unveiling dark realities every time. Yeah, LTL, true crime, we going deep in the dark. Yeah. Peeling back the layers, expose the hidden mark. From the streets to the alleys where the secrets lie. Getting in the minds of the wicked, no alibi. LTL, true crime, unraveling the web of evil. No soul left unturned, we dive into the prime. Yeah, we digging up the dirt, bringing justice to the crime. LTL, true crime, unveiling dark realities every time. LTL, true crime, we go deep in the dark. Peeling back the layers, expose the hidden marks. From the streets to the alleys where the secrets lie. Getting into minds of the wicked, no alibi. LTL, true crime, unravel in the web of evil. No stone left unturned, we dive into the prime. Yeah, we digging up the dirt, bringing justice to the crime. LTL, true crime, unveiling dark realities every time. Yeah. LTL true crime, we going deep in the dark yeah. Peeling back the layers, expose the hidden mark yeah. From the streets to the alleys where the secrets lie Getting into minds of a wicked no alibi, alibi. LTL true crime, unraveling the web of evil No stone left unturned, we dive into the crime Yeah, we digging up the dirt, bringing justice to the crime LTL true crime, unveiling dark realities every time